I think there's a really long delay. Um, I'm gonna. I, can you reply now? Yes. Yes. Oh, maybe there's not as much of a delay as I thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we 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 actually um we actually post the video as well, bud. So we like the. You do. I should have shaved. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, bud. <laughs> You're still looking very handsome, but don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, good, but good. you are okay, good, good. the best. <laughs> you are organized. <laughs> <laughs> well, th the last time I did this, I uh, like ten minutes into the conversation, it's like, oh shit, I forgot to press record after <laughs> I had promised to record. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I know. I noticed that uh, uh, on, on your website, most people have very entertaining pictures of themselves. I'm not sure I can live up to that those standards, but I'll, I'll send I'll, I'll send you a selection of different photos, and hopefully, you can find something that <laughs> That's uh, awesome. that works. Thanks so much, bud. That's cool. Um, oh, brother, good job, my man. Yeah, you too, my man. Great chatting, bud. Well it's done. What a nice guy, bud. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oak. You too, man. Yes. Yes, such a nice guy, yeah, isn't exactly. he? Yeah. Yeah, flipping legend, Oak. Clever. Like super nice, but two yeah. flipping nice oaks in a row, eh? Yeah, I know, I know. It's so good, isn't yeah. it? Woo -hoo 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 -hoo. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, bud. Uh, how's it going, man? How's your day? Yes, uh, pretty darn good, man. How about yours? Yeah, very good. Thanks, bud. Really good. Um, Do you have to? Ah, just, uh, well, still early morning, so just uh, doing a little bit of work this morning, and now we just had a cool little chat, well, like, nice long chat for like an hour, <laughs> <laughs> which is always cool, I always dig our Monday morning chats, and um, <laughs> Likewise. Know, catching up and stuff like that. Yeah, good, man, yeah. and uh, so, uh, yeah, you've uh, been busy with lots of things, and you, you're a guy that's done quite a lot in his life, and uh I remember you've done one or two lucky like, endurance events and uh, I can't remember the name of the one that you did, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about that one. Yeah, but uh, quite a few years ago, I think it was about like four or five years ago now, I did this uh, this, event, this event called the World's Toughest Mudder. And yeah. it's basically like it's a tough mudder event, but you, you do, you qualify for the, the main one, which is held at the end of the year and it's a 24 hour race. And... Wow. It's hectic, like literally you, you're on a racetrack and it, it's got like got off-road and stuff too. And you set up your tent like in the pit lane and you have 24 hours to complete as many laps as you can. And the, the weather is quite, uh, quite harsh actually. So it was, it's in New York. Well, this, this particular one was in New York and the temperature was zero you know, zero sort of for most of the race. Um, oh. And yeah, they, they have to basically run in a wetsuit because you go through water uh, for quite a lot of it as well. There's a swimming element of it too. Um, and it, that the water's freezing. Like, you know, you, you couldn't basically survive in it probably, you know, uh, for, for too long. Uh, so that's why you have to run in a wetsuit as well, like the whole way. Um, and it was, it, it was a crazy event. Like wow. I've, I've written, I've actually written like a, a sort of article on it, um, somewhere and I'll have to sort of share it. Uh, but it really taught me that you can push yourself much more than you actually think you can, you know, your, your mind can easily play tricks on you, but at the same time you can also, uh, sort of take control of it and, and really push yourself much further, in my opinion, uh, based on my experience, than you actually think you can. You, our bodies are so resilient and tough, and uh, we just need to push through. Uh, so it was a massive learning lesson for me from that perspective, and I'm I'm super grateful that I did it because I think it's given me like this sort of extra oomph um, to push myself when I when I think I've kind of reached my limits and you know the the guy that we spoke to this week Alex certainly knows a lot about that and he's also competed in some amazing events and was a serious athlete himself wasn't he Craig yeah for sure he's a he, he's someone who has done so much and he's just a super interesting guy but 
one of the things he has done is excelled at um, different sports and as a sportsman. Um, but he actually writes now uh, for a number of really big publications on a variety of subjects. Um, and the cool thing is that he can write about it because he really did it himself and he excelled at it. So he basically competed uh, for for Canada in track, cross-country, road racing, uh, and mountain running. And in all of those events, he did really well in. Uh, and so when he writes about aspects of fitness and uh, endurance and and mindset, he's someone that like intimately understands that. And, and so he is totally qualified to be writing about it. And he writes really, really well. Uh, and uh, and he's he's particularly humble um, about being such an amazing sportsman, and it t- certainly came totally came through our chat, didn't it? He's he just yeah, he's just such a nice person, and he, you know would never say that he was like such an amazing sportsman, um, but you know mindset was uh, certainly part of his game as a, as an athlete, and uh, he, he's pushed himself in many ways, hasn't he? Yeah, he certainly has. And through that, uh, through pushing himself, uh, like you said, um, he, he's learned a hell of a lot. And off the, off the back of that, he's done a lot of research too when it comes to endurance. And he spent a good eight years writing a book basically on endurance, trying to figure out what it was, you know, that, uh, that sort of made guys push more, you know, and uh, what what was that one thing, you know? And I guess, like you said, in all of his research, there wasn't necessarily that sort of like two minutes elevator pitch which he could go, okay, this is what this is what it actually is, you know. There, there's a few contributing factors, and it was really fascinating chatting to him. And the, the interesting part that. I find and I think we both find about mindset is that our brain can be our strongest and can also be our weakest um, sort of thing you know so you know you can you can be going through like a really sort of maybe tough race or, or you know just even a little jog or something like that and you you start feeling a little bit tired and you just decide to walk you know because you're tired and and that's just it's not really because your body has actually, you know, reached its limits. It's just that you, it, it's given it a warning sign. So you're like, okay, cool. Oh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to walk now. So it's like, it's like kind of in a way it's kind of, you know, weak, but then at the same time you could have this sort of opposite effect and you could be in a running race and you're really, really, you know, at your edge and your, your mind is going, okay, you know, or it's warning your body like, okay, slow down or, or maybe take it a bit easy, but you just go, you know what? I'm not actually going to listen to you. I'm going to carry on pushing because I do know that my body can actually go that little bit more. So mm. it's really, really fascinating. You know what I mean? And when you can tune into that sort of a uh, way of thinking, um, it allows you to kind of, um, I guess, progress a bit more on, on a whole lot of different things. You know, it doesn't have to be fitness. It can be, it can be the other things too. And, yeah, it was just really, really fascinating. And the other really cool thing was Alex is like probably one of the most clever guys you're ever going to mm. um, speak to or listen to. And it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't it great just like hearing some of the stuff that he's done <laughs> and studied and achieved, eh? Yeah, for sure. Like, you yeah, know, it's just incredible. Some people, you know, we've all known people like that in, in some or another form where they just are like incredible minds and then incredible sportsmen and women you know <laughs> and he's certainly one of these people like above and beyond he he is a deep thinker and exquisite mind and and you know when he finished school he decided to give himself a little bit of a challenge and you know he thought what's tough and you, you know oh well you know physics it seems pretty tough let me study some physics and <laughs> he just ended up doing really well got his phd and um, you know, he, he's such a smart guy that, you know, someone that can get deep into quantum computing and nanomechanics 
and still not quite uh, hold his attention to that for very long because he's you know moving on from that. Uh, that tells you a little bit about this guy's intellect. Uh, but uh, you know, like you said, and like we said earlier, just keeping it very humble the whole time. But in actual fact, uh, you know, just such an incredibly, re- really, really rare in- intellect and, and really nice at the same time. But, you know, still being this incredible sports person. So just a really great chat. Uh, we were very grateful for him uh, spending the, the great amount of time he did with us. And uh, the, all these challenges that he's had, one of them that sort of made us laugh a little bit was the the, the ultimate challenge of 15 toddlers, and uh, you know, <laughs> he uh, they they ended up giving him a bit of a hard time and making him uh, reflect on certain philosophical things in his life, which is is quite humorous. But uh, really great chat. So I think it's a good time to hear what makes Alex Hutchinson ridiculously human. Cool man, cool stuff. Well. Uh... Good morning there, Alex Hutchinson from uh, Toronto in Canada. Uh, thank you so much for joining us so early on on a Monday morning, 7.30 for you. Wow, you must have got out of bed early for that. Um, so, yeah, like how how are you going? How was your weekend? Yeah, it's, it's all good. Thanks, guys. And, uh, you know, thanks for joining me on evenings and mornings and wherever in the in the time zone in the world you <laughs> you guys are. Um, and, and I didn't have to wake up early because my two year old woke me up an hour and a half ago. Um, so uh, that's that's the, the way of the world these days. Um, but yeah, I had a, I had a great weekend. This was the first uh, warm weekend in Toronto. We had we had freezing rain and a snowstorm uh, the previous weekend, uh, which was absolutely just just brutal and crushing in spring. Wow! Uh, but we had uh, we had warm temperatures, uh, like perfect sun all weekend, and up to uh, fifteen or sixteen. So we went out for uh, first bike ride of the year and went to the park and all sorts of things. So yeah, oh, good weekend. Must be amazing. Yeah. Well, Gareth can attest to similar weather in, in, in uh, London, I reckon. Yeah, oh, it's been, it's crazy. We've had like the longest, coldest winter like that I can remember being here. And But the last eight days have been beautiful in London. It's like you never get eight days in a row as well. So <coughs> it's uh, it's really cool. <laughs> Yeah, well, I will say my my next door neighbors are from Australia. They they're just they've just been in Canada for two years and they're leaving in a couple months. But I I was chatting with uh, with with one of them yesterday and just saying, look, I know you guys are used to nice weather, but I, I, I swear to you, you've never appreciated a sunny day like you're appreciating a sunny day after going through a Canadian <laughs> winter. So there's something to be said for seasons and for contrast. Yeah, it's so true. Hundred percent, so true. Yeah, hundred like- percent. When you when I lived in uh, Holland, it's like the first day. That's like a little bit springy and and sunny. It's like obviously it's not comparable to to Canada, but still it's 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 gloomy for a lot of the time. And people just go crazy. It's just this buzz everywhere. And and that's when I actually you don't realize that you you feel a certain way until it's so good. And then you realize, okay, wow, there is a massive difference. And I do appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely sneaks up on you. It's it's like going for a run and then stopping. You you don't you don't realize how tired you are until you stop. It's like, yeah, hey, yeah, that actually feels pretty good to stop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, that's so true. It sounds like you had um, <coughs> quite a quite a fun day on Friday, looking after fifteen young toddlers. <laughs> how was that for you? <laughs> yeah, that uh, that's definitely my uh, my my major challenge in the in in life these days. I, like I said, I have a two year old and a four year old. And uh, my four-year-old goes to a, a cooperative nursery school, which means that once every month or two, I'm on duty as the sort of oh, third wow. teacher in the room. Uh, you know, I have to bring snack and and help look after and interact with a bunch of three-year-olds and four-year-olds. And and I'm not uh, not a natural kid person. I, uh, okay. <laughs> I, I I I never actually had many kids until I had kids. So um, yeah, it's it's. I, philosophically, I always think it's it's good to stretch yourself and put yourself in situations of discomfort. And uh, sure. you know, you can choose with this nursery school. You can choose to hire someone to t- take your duty day for you for forty bucks, which you know, forty bucks for you know, relative to the psychological torment of of looking after <laughs> fifteen toddlers, forty bucks is not much. But I've I've sort of over. It's been two two years now that I've been doing this for a year and a half, and. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's good for me. I mean, I think, look, look, I don't want to be, sound like a complete jerk. Um, <laughs> there's also some very heartwarming <laughs> moments and some, some great interactions with the kids, but it's, it's, uh, it's definitely challenging and I think it's good for me and it's, it's, it's helped me, 
you know, push myself and, 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 and get out of my own head and, and remember what it's like to interact with, with three-year-olds, even three-year-olds that I don't know and whose, whose language I can't yet understand. Um, <laughs> so it's, uh, that was my adventure on Friday. And that if I look a little tired, if there's bags under my eyes, that's probably because I'm still, still recovering from the, uh, from, from the experience. <laughs> it also pushes your the limits of one's immune system when you're hanging around with a bunch of random toddlers as well I'd imagine <laughs> yeah I, I'm not sure I have any immune system left it's you know ever since my you know my older kids started going to, to nursery school which was two years ago <coughs> I pretty much had a permanent uh, permanent runny nose <laughs> it's uh yeah you know it's it, and I, I will say I had a bit of a breakthrough on, on Friday I, I saw one of the kids with, you know, snot dripping down her nose and I thought, okay, I'll go get a Kleenex and wipe her nose. I, I, if So far I'd had like this, you know, you break down in stages. It used to be, okay, now I'm comfortable, like, you know, picking up my, my own kid's poop and off the floor and stuff. But now I'm like, <laughs> even I, even another kid, I'll go and wipe her nose be, be, before it drips all over the toys or whatever. So yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm growing as a person. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming more human. I'm sure the parents are like really stoked. They're like, oh, it's that... That Cambridge physicist uh, on this uh, on today again. Like I'm sure they can make my kids really smart. <laughs> yeah, we, we worked on Newton's laws, and uh, yeah, it is interesting. Beauty. Interesting, like I mean, not to go down too too much of a, a black hole here, but it, uh, <laughs> I, I feel like I live in a uh, a neighborhood that's very progressive and and you know not not too hung up on gender roles. But I do think I'm the uh, in the class of 16 kids. I think I'm the only dad who comes. Um, so it, it is, it's oh. still, uh, so, I, and, and I think that's good for the kids too, to see, to see, uh, you know, a, a man in a, in a, in a role that's, yeah. you know, in a place that's, that's still, despite, you know, all the changes is, is still a very female dominated, uh, environment. Yeah. Wow. That, that's interesting. And, and just, just a question, I guess, is that, uh, do you think from the experience you've learned looking after these kids that uh, in all your research on endurance, you maybe you maybe missed something out? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, well, I have to say, uh, you know, I so, uh, you know, I spent all these years writing a book about endurance and it started out as a book about running. But even just just having kids really made me reconceptualize uh, <laughs> endurance and, and sort of, you know, obviously I've thought a lot about this and and about the, the mental side of endurance. And it, I really, I, I, I put a line in the book, something about, you know, the, the similarities between running a marathon and, you know, taking a plane across the country in a, a you know, in a cabin full of angry toddlers. And that was very much <laughs> inspired by the fact that it's like, I was realizing how similar it is trying to put myself through, you know, hard physical training or running a, a hard race and trying to deal with some of the challenges and frustrations of, of parenthood, which, which are, you know, and and the, the mental frustrations and the physical exhaustion of of you know long nights without sleep if if the kids uh, you know not sleeping, which is a pretty common thing. So yeah, absolutely, I I, I see the parallels, and and there could definitely be a, another whole chapter on uh, you know uh, uh, learning to push through and be, become a good parent and the mental challenges there. But also the the, the endurance of the of the little ones. They they uh, maybe it just seems that way because you might be tired, but they can just seem like they can go and go and go until they stop and sleep. But before then, they can just go again, 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 again. Like, and they've got this crazy endurance even uh, at such a young age. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so we just got a, a bicycle for my older daughter and, you know, with training wheels. And it was her second time on it yesterday because it was sunny. So Saturday was her first cool. time and Sunday was her second time. And we went up to a, a, a parking lot and she was just going back. And it was a slight on a slight hill. So she was just working so hard to pedal up the, the uphill <laughs> slope and then bombing down the hill and almost killing yourself. <laughs> awesome. Um, but you know, it's like definitely my patients ran out before her physical exhaustion. I was like, man, we'd already taken her to the park that morning, like two different parks that morning. She, she, she should have been exhausted, but she was just so, you know, having so much fun that she was able to push herself, you know, you know, we all as adults we have this sort of a, a, a anticipation that we we sense when we're getting tired and we sort of dial back but she was willing to go 100 percent until you know until the point where she could barely stand up anymore and i <laughs> had to kind of drag her home and and uh you know, i'd try and get her to bed before she imploded it's like it's like kids when it's uh when the water's cold and they want to swim but they're like 
no, I'm not cold. And then they can swim for like hours on end and you can see them shivering, but they're like, no, 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 I want to swim some more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they haven't reconciled those, the, that, 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 that pain they're feeling of, of freezing to death is, is, it could be stopped if they just decided to get out. They're having too much, too much fun. It's fun. Is <laughs> Classic. So, um, Alexa, just to kind of give the, the chat a little bit of uh, context, um, we are massive like Rich Roll fans who pretty much listen to, to all of his uh, podcasts. And uh, I was listening to like one of his recent ones, which, which had you on it, and it was super fascinating. And I was like, we have to get, we have to try and get Alex on. Um, I, I feel that like one day when we eventually have uh, Rich Roll on as a guest, he's going to be like, wow, man. It's so weird. You have so many of the same guests as me, and uh, <laughs> and and your website looks a lot like mine too. <laughs> and uh, just because I don't know, he's just such a inspirational person and someone we've looked up to for such a long time. So yeah, thank you. I mean, for being so kind and um, you know replying to us so quickly and just being so um, nice on email. It's like wow, we're like cool. This guy's you know just just such a genuine bloke. So. Yeah, very, very cool surprise. And, and thank you, you know, thank you for coming as a guest on our show. And we massively looking forward to speaking to you. We, we put together like, you know, we do like quite a lot of research um, before each chat. And we were like, Craig and I were like, oh, my word. Um, we're going to need hours with this guy because there's so much to talk. <laughs> there's so much interesting stuff that uh, we, you know, we're fascinated by ourselves. Um, so, so, yeah, just uh, thank you for joining us. And um, as part of uh, as part of our podcast, uh, you know, it's nice to um, understand people where they come from, uh, what their stories are, and a little bit about their background. So, if you don't mind, just you know, taking us back a little bit to you know what life was like for you as a youngster, uh, growing up in Toronto, um, with some very interesting parents, um, and yeah, just take us back and and can go from there. Yeah, well, you know, one interesting thing that I'll, I can start by saying is that um, I'm sitting in the house right now doing an interview from the house that I grew up in, wow. Um, wow. which is which is you know un unusual and was unexpected. It, it it was sort of a a confluence of lucky circumstances, and that my uh, so I, I lived away from Toronto for about twenty years, and um, most recently my wife and I were in Australia. Uh, in Sydney and Canberra for four and a half years and we moved back here in 2013 and we had our first daughter in 2014 and realized that our like uh, you know one room apartment was not optimal for having a kid and at, around that time my parents were uh, were getting ready to downsize to a place that was a little easier to maintain as, as they got older and so we were lucky to be able to kind of slide in and 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 move into the house but so it's uh, it's 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 interesting to be back, you know, especially after 20 years away, to be yeah. back in the neighborhood where I grew up. And, and so my my daughter is going to start school uh, in, in September at, at the elementary school that I went to for eight years wow. as a kid. And so and in fact, it's so so I've been thinking a lot about my childhood because it's 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 hard to resist the temptation to try and force my my kids to reenact all, all of my favorite moments like no no you have to you have to climb this tree this is the tree i climbed you have to drop sticks into the river from this point on the bridge because this is where i stood on the bridge dropping sticks into the river and, and trust me it's fun and it made me into the, the made me into the man i am today so you drop that damn stick um so but uh yeah no i was i was very lucky um i had a i had a a, a relatively pleasant childhood. Uh, I had, it was a, you know, um, there's, I live near the Humber river, which is a, a river that flows into Lake Ontario. I'm out about a block from that. And it's, it's Toronto had a hurricane in 1954, hurricane hazel that wiped out a lot of houses and killed a few people. It's very rare to have a hurricane in Toronto, but that was a wake up call that you can't have houses in a, a, a floodplain. And so they, they got rid of all the houses in the, in, in the Humber river, uh, uh, valley and turned it into so it's um wow. it runs you know 30k north from from basically one block from my house i i get into this big park land that runs yeah 30k north and maybe 8k south to the lake to lake ontario where it connects with paths that go hundreds of kilometers in either direction along the shore of the lake so i had a i have a really i had a, I had a really great place to run around and play as a kid to to in 
essentially forested area, even though I'm in the middle of a city of 4 million people. Wow. Um, but, uh, but I connect to this little, the, this wilderness corridor. And, and if, if you go down to the Humber river, I, you know, if, if I go running early in the morning, I see deer, uh, I see beavers sometimes, cool. uh, I had an opossum walking through my backyard the other day, <laughs> wow. uh, coyotes. So, so I, you know, in terms of the, the, the having a childhood where you can play, where you can get out into nature, all these things that I think a lot of us realize are, are so much more important than maybe we realized uh, in the past. I, I was lucky in that I spent a lot of time just uh, even, even in a very urban childhood, uh, w- wandering around through the woods, playing playing imaginary games, building forts out of sticks, and and all that sort of thing. Yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 we could spend eight eight hours of me recovering yeah, the, the, the highlights of, of my childhood, but, None of but, but 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 yeah, that was that was that th- that's kind of one thing that leaps to mind, and 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 the other thing that I remember is, and it's interesting, you know, contrasting to today, where I'm I'm on a real, relatively quiet street, but. The world is a little quicker paced these days. More cars go by. It's it's a little busier. But when I was a kid, um, when school ended, which was three thirty, we all came home and we played street hockey, huh. mostly sometimes baseball, sometimes. Not. But for the most part, we played street hockey from three thirty until like six when everyone had dinner, um, like pretty much every day, unless we were playing That's some so other cool. game. <laughs> and the whole the whole neighborhood was out. Um, playing and and that's um a lot of things have changed so uh, you know you look out on the street you don't see that anymore partly because the streets are a little busier partly because people have things to do inside you know yeah, what, yeah. Whatever, whether it's watching tv or, or 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 whatever the case may be and I, I so as i contemplate you know what my kids childhood or as they is going to look like as they grow up and how to try and steer it I, I i think a lot of also about that aspect of my of my childhood which was that um that's you know I, I, when i got a little older my parents since my parents weren't home from and i was allowed to sort of come home by myself sometimes i'd sneak in and watch scooby-doo from 3 30 to 4 or whatever oh, yes. or from 4 to 4 30 <laughs> and that you know that was that was great but yeah you know, so it's not like I, I by no means was i like never never watching tv or anything like that but we spent it was just expected that we spent a lot of time outside and and I and in fact I can remember that my, my the 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 example that my parents gave me or the, the expectations that my parents set was that I I grew up with the idea that being outside and playing was a positive thing that they imp- uh, uh, really approved of mm. and so I I knew if if they came home and I was outside throwing a ball against the wall uh, against the garage door which is what I spent a lot of time doing pretending I was a pitcher, um, <laughs> they wouldn't interrupt me. They wouldn't call me in and make me do chores if I was outside playing. Whereas if I was inside sitting on TV, you knew I was going to be, up, you know, helping chopping something for, for dinner. That's clever. So I, I, I'd be, you know, lie, lying there, uh, you know, watching Scooby-Doo or whatever. And then, you know, okay, that's coming home. Got to go outside and start playing. So it was like a duty. And it was a, 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 a invulnerability shield that I wouldn't have to do anything I didn't want to do. I was outside running around because they approved of it. So I think... I, I, I'm really grateful that they uh, didn't make me do more chopping, but also that they sort of instilled this idea in me that I, I that I that I really internalized that being outside and running around and jumping and playing was was something to be encouraged and something positive uh, that that they felt it was productive time for me to be outside running around, and so I think I was really lucky in that respect. Uh, yeah, it sounds really idyllic that actually it's just um, to be with your mates and just being outside and playing it it's like brings back so many good memories for for myself i'm sure for you as well gareth it's yeah. just i'm pretty much sure we had a very similar way and the light sort of starts to go down and then you kind of know okay you got to say cheers to your mates and everyone goes back and you like ravenous and you you go in and <laughs> there's a good meal waiting for you you have a sit down and yeah it's just such a good memory there but i guess you know what how do you see that the the how how are you going to do the curtailing or the uh, of the sort of digital time and the versus the you know now is enough now you must go outside because obviously it's also a normal way of life now so what, what is your solution to the finding balance yeah that's I, I mean this is why i've been thinking about it because i worry about it and i i don't know how you know you, you can swim against the 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 peer pressure tide to some extent but at a certain point like you know if <laughs> <coughs> excuse me if i if i tried 
you know, tell my daughters, you're, you know, you're not going to have a phone until you're 28 years old and, you know, <laughs> you're never going to watch anything on the screen. It's just not going to work, right? Like, they, you know, you don't have that much control over their lives. And so uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'll tr we'll, we'll try and lead by example. Um, mm. You know, my wife and I, we, we go running pretty much every morning. That's what we enjoy doing. We, we kind of, these days we have to take turns. So mommy will go running and then daddy will go running. And so we actually had a bit of a, a tantrum uh, yesterday morning because mommy was going running and, and my two-year-old was putting on her, her hat and try, and boots try, wanting to go running with mommy and, it's like, <laughs> and was crying when she couldn't sit. So then I had to take her out. So it's like, I, I hope that we can set an example that will encourage them to behave a certain way. But also it's like, you know, I mean, parenting is hard. And, and uh, as much as I, we like to limit screen time, we we now say, okay, after dinner, they get to watch a show every every night while we kind of clean up the kitchen and try and, you know, recover from the, the shell shock. And uh, <laughs> and and even sometimes, you know, on weekends, it's like, and this happened this past weekend, if we're like desperately trying to, uh, you know, get a meal ready or clean up the house or just, you know, if we have work to do or whatever, will sometimes put on it put on the, the, a show because it's so effective at getting them to to you know calm down <laughs> and 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 get out of our hair so um so i you know so i re it's a constant struggle of like oh it would be really easy to just turn on the tv right now so that i could finish what i need to do <laughs> since they woke up early from the nap versus uh tr trying to have some sort of uh, standard of you know we're not going to do that so i i I, I don't know, and I, I worry about it. I hope they'll. they'll I, I I know we can set a good example, but I hope we can find. I hope they can find friends who will be following a similar approach, who will want to be outside with them, so that every time they, they get together with their friends, the impulse isn't to run inside and and start playing a video game. Yeah. But uh, but you know, I mean, this isn't just about kids, right? Like it's it's also yeah. about us. Uh, I, I and and probably the most something I, I need to like sort out both my wife and I need to sort out is it's like if we're sitting making dinner, are we pulling out our phones and checking email uh, mm -hmm. when the kids are there? And it's like, I, you know, and I, there, there've been some articles recently, which I think are really interesting uh, this, you know, arguing that self-control is overrated, that people who think they're being really disciplined about, uh, uh, you know, they, they don't, they eat the right foods or whatever. It's really not that correlated with their self-control. It's more a question of, them, you know, setting up their environment so they don't, or, or so they don't have mm. to make difficult choices, or that they're they actually enjoy the, you know, like for me going for a run every day. It's not that I wake up every morning and exert self control. It's actually I, I enjoy going for a run. Um, where's I going with this? Oh yeah. So, um, so in terms of not using screen times too much, my my approach to that, or, or being distracted, is is like so I have a I have a phone, but I don't have data on my phone because I know. Not because I don't think it's useful, but because I think it's so useful that I would spend all my time looking at, <laughs> at, at the phone. The problem is when I'm at home, I have Wi-Fi on the phone, so I can check my email. Uh, I can, you know, if, if the kids are driving me nuts, I can pull out my phone and just I check my email. Hope there's some email that distracts me from this, and that's 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 bad. That that's that's an example that they're gonna they're gonna pick up for sure. Yeah, for sure. And but but don't you like? I mean, you know, be, being a physicist, you. You know, surely like technology is something that you are massively interested in. So it's almost like this challenge that you must face, I guess, when, you know, in everyday life, like trying to find this balance. Yeah. You know, so the best example of that is is technology in exercise, like wearable technology, because not only do I sort of find that cool and interesting, it's actually kind of what I've been doing for the last 10 years is writing about the science and technology of fitness and health. And, and so in a sense, it's like, okay, I come from a science background. I am writing about fitness. So I get like a million pitches a day of, of from companies doing very, very cool things about monitoring the body and, yeah. you know, new technology you can wear. Um, and I, what I do, what I wear, what I use as is, is uh, you know, this, uh, you know, $50 watch. It, 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 it's a stopwatch and that's it. I don't, I don't wear a heart rate <laughs> monitor. I don't wear a movement tracker. And again, it's, it's similar to the smartphone thing. It's not that I don't think the data is interesting or useful. Uh, it's that I, I think for me, it's too interesting and too useful. And so I'm a guy who, when I got into running in the 1990s, um, 
I knew I loved data. I knew I loved technology. I knew I loved science. And so I was reading books like Tim Noakes' Lore of Running, getting all these ideas about, oh, if you want to avoid overtraining, you know, you can measure not just your heart rate, you can measure your, your resting heart rate while lying down when you wake up in the morning, then you get up and 15 seconds later, you measure your, your, your resting heart rate again. You take the difference between those two values. And if there are changes, dramatic changes in that, in that value, then that's an early warning sign that you're overtraining. So, so I was taking, you know, multiple heart rates every morning when I woke up, Plot, you know, writing them down in a, in a training log and plotting in Lotus one, two, three, the, the sort of trend graphs and running averages of my, you know, morning heart rate, di- resting heart rate differential or whatever. <laughs> so in other words, I, like, I love the data and I love playing with it. I love graphing <laughs> it, but it was hard back then. So you had to, you had to kind of work to get a little bit of data. So there was a, a finite amount of data you had. Now, if I put on a GPS watch and a heart rate monitor and go for a run, I can have like unlimited streams of data about that about you know my you know left right foot balance and my vertical <laughs> oscillation and my pace and my heart rate and you know everything you can possibly think of and so it becomes you know or it risks becoming a little bit sort of masturbatory for for someone like me who already likes the data so my solution is kind of like it's kind of like the alcoholic who 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 become who you know if, if an alcoholic's trying to quit you you don't uh you don't say I'm just going to have two drinks a night. You, you say I'm, I'm, I'm not going to drink. So I, I mean, I, I'm not. I'm sort of painting myself in a negative light here, but, um, but exactly what you're saying. It's it's a it's a it's a challenge for me because it's not that I think these technologies are stupid or useless. It's yeah. that I think they're so easy to spend too much time or put too much devote too much attention to. At, at, and there's a cost to that. There's a cost to be you know, like in the running context, there's a cost to. Um, being in tune with your sense of of effort, of understanding when you're pushing the right amount and when you're pushing too much, and feeling that rather than rather than relying mm. on a device to tell you that. In the the, the the device context, there's a there's an attentional cost to check. Yeah, there's a benefit to checking my email eight times a day because then if something important comes through, I can, uh, you know, I can respond to it quickly or be aware of it. But there's a cost too in terms of my ability to focus for long periods of time, and I really struggle with that. Like I I need to. I need to stop checking Twitter as often as I do and stop checking my email and just, you know, allow myself to focus for 45 minutes at a time. So everyone's everyone for everyone will have a different optimal balance for that. And I'm, I don't think I'm at my optimal balance, but yeah, that's, that's, that's why I don't have data on my phone and don't run with a GPS watch. Yeah. And, and Alex, just while you discussing um, some of the metrics and that, are there certain metrics that you find invaluable for your own personal running at the moment, like maybe heart rate variability or, or, or do you just literally just do times at this stage? So I'll say I, me, I just do time. Um, mm. And, and I, these days I don't even keep a training log. But that's that's partly a function of where I'm at in my in my sort of training life right now. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm 42 and with two kids at home, my, my training, like I, I run, you know, six days a week probably, but I'm, I'm training maybe both you know, 30% of what I trained when I was, when I was competing seriously. So uh, my, my goals right now, my, basically my goal is to stay fit and have fun and stay fit enough that if, you know, if, if life kind of settles down a little bit in a few years, I'm still fit enough that I can get back and be more serious about it. If I was more seriously chasing performance goals, I think mm. I would consider looking more deeply into some of these metrics so the fact that i don't use these metrics again isn't necessarily a statement that i don't think any of them are useful yeah sure i i think hrv heart rate variability something i've been kind of in fact i just um just yesterday i was putting together some pitches for future stories for for a magazine i write for and and that's one of the things i mentioned that maybe it's worth another deep dive into that it's been around so the the it, there's a lot of promises with heart rate variability, but the sort of most interesting one to me is the idea that you wake up in the morning and it tells you whether you're ready to train hard today or whether you need an easy day. And that that idea has been out there for five or ten years now. Um, and it, uh, to me, the evidence has remained pretty shaky. That like so, the, the principles mm. make sense, but the problem is that there's so much variability in heart rate variability <laughs> that it's 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 to, to take a single number or even a running average of a few days has 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 been a little bit uh, i think 
maybe overselling the, abil the, the, the ability of the data. But, but it may be getting closer. I, I, and so I, 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 I've, like there was a study recently that where, with French elite skiers that, that, that used heart rate variability to guide training with some interesting results. So I, there's that, that kind of stuff that I think if I was in a more performance-focused phase of my life, I would I would probably consider experimenting with 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 that, and I think even simpler stuff like heart rate um, has some uh, like like to keep monitoring your heart rate during training, not necessarily to tell you how fast you should run, but to tell you how hard you're working. So you mm -hmm. you after the run, you look at how fast you ran, you look at your heart rate, and you're able to say, well, my heart rate was elevated compared to what it normally would be for a, a time like that. And that uh, that can give you some valuable information. So I, I do think there's there's definitely value in some of that kind of data. Um, and yeah, heart rate heart rate variability I think are two uh, are two pretty interesting interesting ones to keep in mind as long as you don't kind of oversell what they're capable of doing for now. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Yeah, I think it's easy to kind of get fixated on those sort of things and yeah you know, use them I guess too much sometimes. Um, so yeah, Alex, uh, just uh, just to kind of also take it back a little, you know, we talk, you spoke a lot about uh, running there and running is obviously such a big thing for you. Um, you know, you've competed at an extremely high level. You've actually represented Canada um, on track, cross country um, and road racing. Um, and, and this sort of journey started for you in, I think when you said you were about 15 years old, uh, you started running the 1500 meters and uh, you also i think been um a, a finalist in the canadian 1500 meters uh competition twice uh so can you just tell us like how this started and then uh, just sort of use that as kind of a trajectory to take us you know through a few years and stuff because it's a really interesting story and i guess it's part of um how you became interested in mindset too um, in terms of your own performance and, and how that sort of changed over time. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so going back to the, uh, to the very beginning, I, I, I was like, we were talking about earlier, I was always a kid who ran around a lot. And, um, and so I was, you know, playing tag in the playground when I was five or six years old, I, I had the sense that I was fast, that running was something I was good at. Um, so that, that's something that, um, that came, came, so, somewhat naturally to me but there's a big difference between running around the playground and and feeling like you're 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 fast and uh training and competing and so uh, so i had i did in that like elementary school i, I ran on the school cr cross-country team and things like that but uh yeah when i was 15 i uh i joined a local track club the university of toronto track club and uh with the intention at that point i, I was in it was my last year in a younger age group uh, in high school competition. And so I thought I'm going to join this track club for three months so that I can do as well as I can in this younger age group before I move up to the older age group. And then I'll stop running because, you know, then I'll be running against the, the, the big kids and that'll be too hard. But while I was 15, I thought I would see it, see how well I could do. And, uh, and it went better than I expected. I, 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 I won the Ontario, uh, high school, uh, my, in my age group, the Ontario championships, um, which is the the province that wow. Toronto is in, and uh, in the 800 and 1500, and I thought, hey, this is fun, like, <laughs> um, you know, and and you know, at that time, my analysis was, hey, winning races is fun, and, and you know, having my name read out in the announcements at school and so on, so I, it was very much at, at the start a performance focused uh, interest in running, and it wasn't until probably when I was 20 two or so I, I got I got injured um, and had to stop uh, basically I missed a couple of years of running and that was that's kind of a it was interesting timing and and and, and interesting in the in the in the sense that it's natural to compete uh, in a sport when you're in high school and to, to some extent in university it's it's much more you're sort of swimming against the stream if you decide to train and compete really seriously after you finished university and and i had the and i just made the point where i got when i got injured so i had this sense that there might be potential for me to you know take a shot at making the olympics which was you know it's obviously the sort of the, the, the top level goal 
but I had to make a, a tough choice as to whether, okay, am I going to focus on a career and on being a grown up and, and so on, or am I going to try and train really hard? And c coinciding with this choice was the fact that I got hurt for two years, so I couldn't even run. So, so then I was going to have to make the choice. Uh, eventually, I was 24, and I hadn't competed in a couple of years, wow. and, and I had to decide, am I going to try and dive back in? and 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 pick up and i was by no means a like oh this guy's gonna make the olympics i'd made one lower lower tier national team just before getting injured um all of which is to say that that experience of missing a couple of years forced me to come to terms or forced me to think carefully about what it is that i wanted out of running what 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 it was that it meant to me and the sort of co the, the analysis that i ended up doing for myself was that if I was going to return to running, make it the most important thing in my life at age 24, um, it wasn't going to be a very good, a uh, very wise choice to do that. If my expectation was that success would be defined by making the Olympics, that 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 because you know as an adult you no longer have any age categories or anything. You you're competing against the best, and so uh, whoever you are, for everyone except one person in the world, you're going to lose more races than you win. Um, and, yeah. and it's, you know, it's no, no longer going to be that nice protected little environment where you can go out and beat up on the, the, the local kids <laughs> and, and feel, feel good about yourself. So there has to be something more there that makes it worthwhile. And, and ultimately what I realized, you know, after a lot of reflection was that I, I really enjoyed running. I really enjoyed, um, the process of training, of, of having a goal, even if that goal was probably unattainable but a goal that was not 100 percent unattainable and that was all consuming was really difficult that demanded everything of myself so i liked the physical aspect of, of being fit i liked training i also just i liked the the sense of being committed of of trying to do something really hard and so that was the kind of switch for me at that point in my early 20s it's, which is the reason at 42, I'm even though I'm not training for anything particular, I still go out and run, like I said, six, probably six, seven days a week. And I do, I don't just go for jogs. I do a couple of hard workouts a week. I do a tempo run with some friends on Saturday mornings. I do a one or two interval workouts during the week, during which I, you know, I, I get out there and thrash myself Yeah. because, mm -hmm. because I've decided that, that, uh, or I've, I've come to the conclusion that that's, it's worthwhile. It's, it's fun. It's interesting. It's, it's, uh, it makes my days better, and it's it just kind of, you know, I, I I'm not articulating it very well, but but uh, it, it became something where I loved the process as much as the result. Whereas when I started as yeah. a 15 year old, it was it was the result that I was like, hey, I like winning races. Yeah. So um, so that's the that's the kind of trajectory of how I got into running. Uh, you you mentioned my sort of uh, my my transformation story, which I think is 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 maybe. We're, we're worth telling just to yeah, get, give a sense of yeah, totally. uh, how I got, got interested in in uh, in the question of, of limits of, of human limits of of because uh, you know the the fundamental if you're competing as a runner your goal is to get everything out of yourself to to reach your limits but but you sort of start to realize uh, eventually that it's really hard to put your finger on. Uh, um, what is you know what what are you capable of on any given day or 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 in ultimate terms and i guess just to not to to be too meandering but to flash forward to the sort of end of my really serious competitive career was when i was 28 um that was just before the 2004 olympic trials and i i was probably in the shape of my life although i wasn't racing particularly well but i was i was very fit and and three months before the Olympic trials, I I got a stress fracture in my in my sacrum, so in my lower back, uh, and and those take about eight to, eight to ten weeks of no running whatsoever. Um, so when that happens three months before the Olympic trials, it's like okay, you know. So I I so just to, to backtrack, I I'd, I'd been a finalist at the Canadian Olympic trials in 1996 when I was uh, 20, uh, and then that injury I was discussing when in when I was uh, you know 23 24. Uh, that kept me out of the 2000 Olympic trials. In fact, I did. Wow. So I, I was injured in 98 and 99 and just starting to run again in 2000. And I qualified for the Olympic trials, but I wasn't going to be competitive. So I, I didn't bother going because I just needed to sort of build, build start building my fitness back up. Yeah. So I missed the two, 2000 trials. Then in 2004, I was finally in the shape of my life. And then I got this stress fracture three months before oh. uh, the trials. So that was, that was frustrating. And it yeah. was like, 
it was one of those moments where you say, well, I'm glad I decided I was interested in the process and not the outcome. The, <laughs> yeah, the outcome has, right. has, has turned out to be very disappointing. But, wow. uh, you know, at that, at that point, again, there's this, this kind of side so to decide, okay, and that, and that, you know, that, in the end, that that moment was then I, when I decided to leave physics and go do. Basically, I, I I walked away from running. I kept competing and actually kept. I made some more national teams, but I no longer running was the most important thing in my life until I was 28. And when I was 28, I was I said, all right, it's time to to have a different passion. So I, I left physics, which I made my career up to that point, and went to journalism school. Started out from scratch as as a journalist uh, at, at 28. Uh, and switched my path, you know, sort of switched my overall focus and passion to journalism, which was a good choice, I think. But, it, or, you know, in hindsight, it was a great choice. But one of the things that required doing is is asking myself, OK, I've invested all this time in running. Have I reached like have I have I have I reached my my limits? Like, could I go faster? What were my limits? I've run 342 for 1500. Yeah, I felt like I could run 336. Was that true? Or was I just kidding myself? Was yeah. I, you know, how, where were my limits? And and there's no answers to these questions, really. Like, ultimately, what you realize is there's no calculation, there's no lab test that can tell you, yes, you were capable mm -hmm. of, you know, 336.8. And so you were just, you know, a mental midget and that's why you only ran 342 or wow. like oh actually you were only capable of 342 you achieved a hundred percent of your physical capacity yeah uh, but so okay so all of that is by way of, of preamble to to the the reason i found this this question so difficult to answer is is that i i was a good high school runner but not a great one i ran 402 for 1500 when i was 16 so that's hmm. and that, you know 1500 is it's a 402 is like a 420 mile. Um, and so I kind of figured four minutes for 1500 was a pretty nice round number uh, and something that I would I would achieve pretty quickly. Um, but I didn't. I, I, I actually got stuck right at that kind of level for, for about four years. So I was running 402, yeah. 401 over and over again. And so by the time I was 20, you know, I was in my third year of university, my, my personal best was still 401.7. Um, and and so at that point, I had the sense that I that I really was approaching my physical sort of ultimate capacity. It's like, okay, four years. I'm an adult now. I've been training for four years, training pretty hard. Um, I keep running roughly the same time, and it hurts. So this must be this must be what I'm what I'm capable of. Uh, and I you know I was pretty confident I could run 359.9 if I got it if you know if everything came together on the right day. But I didn't think there was a whole lot more in the tank. And um, and what ended up happening is I was uh, I was running a very small, low-key meet uh, in uh, in a place called Sherbrooke, and uh, you know I, I went out and did my you know I was doing my best on, uh, and uh, but but without there was no competition in the race and there wasn't much expectation. But I went through the first lap and the timekeeper who calls out the times it was at the, and it was an indoor track, so every two hundred meters. And he called out 27 seconds, hmm. which is way, way, way faster than what I needed to run 32 to run a four minute 1500, which is what, what I wanted to do. And 27 is pretty close to what I'm what I'm capable of. Wow. And uh, so I had part of me had this sense that, OK, I, you know, I'm screwed. I've gone out way too fast and I'm going to pay a, a really unpleasant price. Uh, <laughs> hit the wall. <laughs> in, in later, yeah, I'm going to hit the wall and it's going to be ugly. But another part of me was thinking, oh, actually, Actually, I felt okay. That's the, like the easiest 27 I've ever run. Uh, and I went through the the second lap, and uh, again, it was like 57 or something like that, which is is way too fast for 1500. But but this, so I was thinking, oh, what have you done, you moron? But another part of me was thinking, it's like, and yet it feels okay. <laughs> so so by the time I went through the third lap, I was like, okay, I don't know what's going on, but I'm having the day of my life, and and you know. Alex, do not waste this opportunity. This is this is things are going well. Don't 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 pass up this moment. So I, I stopped listening to the splits and just put my head down and, and ran. And I and I ended up crossing the line in three fifty two, wow. um, which was a nine second personal best after four years of being Jeez, stuck at the crazy. same level. That's crazy. And, yeah. and so it was yeah it was a it was a very very good feeling that that moment. Um, but, you know, I was debriefing with my teammates after and one of them had taken my splits for me um, so that I could put them in my log and, and you know, graph them in Lotus 1, 2, 3 and all that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was saying, oh, boy, that 
you know, that first, those first couple of laps were really fast. And he was like, oh, they were okay. You know, they were, you know, 30, 31, something like that. And uh, I was like, what? <laughs> I thought it was 27. <laughs> and, and, and so it, what it turned out is the timekeeper had, had been giving me the wrong splits. And I don't know, either he, you know, he, he, he either started his watch like three seconds late or something like that, or he was, it was in a French part of Canada. Maybe he was having trouble translating. Or I, I don't know what happened, but he, he, uh, he misled me into thinking I was having like the, the, the ultimate day of my life. And so I did. Wow. Um, and the, the really sort of interesting thing for me was that it, that once that switch was flipped, it, it never flipped back. I, wow. I, uh, I never struggled to break four minutes again. And, uh, and in my next attempt at the distance, I ran 349. Wow. And in the race after that, I ran 344. So wow. in, in the course of three races, I went Jeez. from four, 401 to 344. And that's that, that, that 344 is what qualified me for the, the Canadian Olympic trials that summer. And so, you know, after that moment, I could never sort of cross the finish line <laughs> feeling like I had given everything I had. I never, be, I could never be confident that that was everything because I'd had this experience of something mental flipping or, or being, you know, uh, some deception, uh, changing and suddenly being on a totally different level. And so I'm, you know, look, the, the story I'm sure, I'm sure I was probably ready for a physical breakthrough in some way, but there's more to it than, than that. Yeah. There was, there was clearly, you know, a question of either my, you know, I was being held back by my, my thoughts or what, you know, whatever the case may be it made it much harder for me to believe that, you know, I could ever have any sort of equation that would tell me or lab test that would tell me what I would run for the 1500. So, and that, that kind of seeded the, the, the curiosity that got me started. First of all, as a journalist writing about, uh, you know, the science of endurance and trying to understand limits and then ultimately on the sort of path that it led to, to writing a book about it. Wow. Oh, that's an incredible story. Yeah. That is like, so, so did you, did you, um, I mean, if it would, if it was purely based on some kind of, uh, physical limit or, or change that you had a, a, approached, um, you would have, I would imagine you would have noticed a progressively, um, decreasing time, not just this massive sh change in one go, number one. And also once it had, that switch had flipped, had you or were you aware like, wow, this is some kind of mental trickery that's going on here at the time? Or had you kind of just gone, oh, well, wow, that's cool. Let's just keep going. Or had you been aware that there could be a mental thing happening here at this stage? Yeah, it's interesting. And it's, 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 it's of course, very hard to, to remember what my thoughts were at the time to, without superimposing my you know, current sure. knowledge. Um, so my sense was that I, I, I could, I felt like I was better than my races had showed. Um, so I did feel like the, that I should be able to run better than I had, had demonstrated. I had no, like, you know how you have, like, I, I'd like to do this. I think I can do this. I hope I can do that. I dream of doing that. You have different levels of, of expectation. And, and running 344 three races later was beyond even my dreams. Like, I didn't lie awake at night dreaming of running that. So the, the, this was well beyond what I had any suspicion I could do. And I've certainly spent a lot of time looking back at my training logs from from that time, Cause especially when things start going poorly. You, you always look back and say, "Okay, what was I doing when I was running well? What you know? Oh, oh, it's because I was doing that workout, or it's because I ran that long three days before the race. That must have been the magic." So I spent a lot of time looking for looking for patterns or looking for hints that something was going to change. Um, and and there's really not much there. I mean, I knew I was I was fit, but but again, it's like. I should have been five seconds faster than I was running, not 17 seconds faster. Um, and so, so even at, at the time, I, I definitely was like, okay, I knew that the, the splits thing, the, the, the sort of deception had played some role in, in, in uh, kind of uh, shaking me out of a, 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 a trap. So I knew, I, I, I did feel like there was some mental component. And in a sense, I think it became almost a bit of a, a trap for me, because um, what I what I concluded was that so I I'd already, I would always prided myself before this moment of, as as being a big race runner, that that I I often trained with uh, with the, the the group I trained with both in high school and and in university, I ended up being the strongest runner in the group by by quite a bit, 
but I would train with them. So I, I was training with a bunch of four minute guys while running 344 and we were running workouts together. So I was my, my, I, I, I sort of, the, the story I came to tell myself was that I was capable of pushing, pushing myself in competition, that I wanted it more than, than most of my peers and was capable of digging to a deeper place. Mm. And there's probably, there's probably some truth to that, but the problem is, when you when you when that becomes your personal mythology, it, it it becomes an expectation. And so I would, if if you're telling yourself, okay, I may not be as strong physically as these guys, but I'm mentally tougher, so I can do something that's harder than them. Then eventually it becomes this double-edged sword where you show up to a race and you're looking around, telling yourself all these runners are better than me, and so in order for me to beat them, I have to do something superhuman. Whereas for them mm. to beat me, all they have to do is be their normal selves. Wow. They just have to run to 100% to beat me. I have to run to 120% to be able to beat them. And so that became this sort of cycle where in, you know, in the years after that, I had, a, I had a few years where I was running really well. And then I had some years, especially after my injury, uh, after a couple of years of injury coming back, I think I, I came back physically all the way. I was, I was, I was fit. But I, I struggled to get back that mental confidence, and I would I would show up at the line, and I would just be, you know, paralytically nervous, because I'd been thinking I'd be thinking, okay, I have to be the one who is pushing harder and hurting more and and achieving do you know achieving more magic, and so I think that when we start talking about the psychological elements of performance, I think it's so much more complicated than just like you have to want, want it more, you have to push it. Mm. It's it's very individual, and I think for me it became. Uh, you know, my understanding of the sort of psychology of performance was very limited and just sort of, you know, self, self-discovered, self-taught. I didn't really think about these things uh, carefully or correctly, I think. And so I, I think I ended up overemphasizing the power of psychology and, and sort of making it become, a, 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 you know, almost a source of, of terror in knowing that I would have to be the toughest. Yeah. Wow. I, I'm I'm almost wondering like if that uh, that time judge, he this was like something that he did often. He would be like, "Yeah, I'm going to see some records today, so I'm going to tell all these runners uh, the complete wrong time." <laughs> well, it's it, it's it's interesting you say that. I, I it, it wouldn't be surprising. Uh, 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 but I had a I had a coach uh, much later on when in my in my mid twenties, uh, a guy named Matt Centrowitz, who's uh, um, he himself was a great runner in the seventies and eighties, a, a, you know, a two-time Olympic runner in the U S his son, Matt Centris jr. Actually won the Olympic gold medal in the 1500, uh, this past Olympics in 2016. Wow. Um, wow. so it's like a, you know, uh, a, a very, uh, uh, well-credentialed family, but the, the, the dad, Matt, Matt senior was, a he was a, a very interesting coach. Uh, it, it, like he he wasn't necessarily a good temperamental match for me. I'm this hyper analytical guy <laughs> who wants to plan far ahead, know exactly what's happening, know why we're doing everything. Uh, Centro was a very intuitive coach, or is a very intuitive coach. Uh, guy, guy who doesn't you know worry too much about sweating all the details. That it'll you know to to him it's like just get fit and the opportunities will come. Don't worry. I'd be thinking. <laughs> If I want to make the Olympics, I have to make Olympic standard. If I want to make Olympic standard, I have to be in a race that goes fast enough. If I want to be in a race that goes fast enough, I have to run fast enough to get into that race. So it's like, <laughs> it starts tomorrow. I have to get into a race to get into the race that will get me into the race that will get me into the race that will get me into the race. <laughs> Whereas you would say, you're, you're not ready to run Olympic standard, so why are you worrying about racing? Yeah. Let's just train. <laughs> when you're ready to run Olympic standard, an opportunity will prevent it will present itself and you'll yeah. run it. It's like, that's, I don't want to just wait and leave it to chance. So... Uh, I'll, the reason I'm th thinking of him is that, uh, again, another example of our sort of disparate personalities, I, I would be, you know, he would tell us to run mile reps or whatever. And he'd say, I want you to do, you know, first lap 70, second lap 68, third lap 66, um, you know, very, very specific instructions. And so I would get kind of wrapped up and worried about that because you're training with a group. You don't want to screw up everyone else's workout if you're leading the, the, the pace. So I, you know, initially I'd be checking my, checking my splits every 400 meters, every lap. And then I'd, you know, after a few screw ups and I don't want to screw up again. So I'll check at 200 and then at 400. And then after a while I was checking every 100 meters. So the, the <laughs> start I, every hundred meters, every like 17 seconds, I'd be looking down at my watch and Centro, like what the hell are you doing boy? Like, so he, he'd forced me to take my watch off. In the middle of an interval, I'd be running, 
take that watch off and throw it in the infield. So I'd have to take my watch off and throw it. And then I'd feel like I was running naked. I had no idea what was going on. And he uh. won. Like all these things that I was saying earlier about being in touch with your effort and stuff. I say that because I struggle with it. And it, and it was Century who had to yell at me and tell me to take the watch off. But the other thing is, he was so relaxed about all this stuff. So he'd be like, don't time your intervals. Take your goddamn watch off. I'll time the intervals. You run, I'll time. <laughs> then half the time, he'd forget to start his watch at the start of the <laughs> interval. So, and I didn't realize this until I'd been training with him for a while. It's like, so, so uh, you know, when I had to, you know, I was injured or something, so I wasn't running the whole workout. So I was standing with him while the other guys were running. And they'd start their interval. And halfway through the first lap, he'd say, oh, damn it, I forgot to start my watch. So they, they'd come through the first lap, you know, busting their ass, thinking, oh, we have to get the exact right time. And he'd just make up a time. He'd be like, uh, 72, go faster. Or like, 68, what are you doing? Or right on. It's like, you just made up the time. You have no idea how fast they just ran that lap. And it, so, but, you know, so I'm sure he was sort of, uh, enhancing their performance uh, inadvertently sometimes, but but man, uh, that that shook my faith because you know, like every time I came through a lap, did you just make that time up? Was that real? I don't know. Is that, should I trust you? <laughs> uh, that's classic. I, I can imagine um, when his son uh, won the Olympics, it would have been quite loud in your house when you were watching that final. Eh? You must have been going crazy. It, it, it was amazing because you know, when I was training with Centro Senior, Centro Junior was uh, uh, just starting. He, I think he, he was maybe grade nine or so, grade eight, grade nine, grade ten while I was while I was there. And what I remember is that his older sister, that so um, Centro Junior's older sister, was was already running quite well and and winning a lot of races. And so he, the Centro Junior, wanted to start running track and his dad was discouraging him from from running tracks no oh, no no you shouldn't run you shouldn't run uh, yeah. running is a tough sport you're not tough enough for that yeah keep playing soccer that's where soccer is good for 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 kids like you so really kind of <laughs> holding him back but also needling him and kind of uh yeah yeah you know you're not tough enough for running oh it's a tough <laughs> sport <laughs> but it, yeah it was exciting to, to watch him win the race and and it was also exciting to see the way he won the race which was it was, uh, as, as a lot of people noted, it was the slowest winning time for a 1500 since 1932, I think it was. Wow. Uh, and that's not because the runners in the race weren't fast, but because it was a tactical uh, race. It was a, it was a, a real chess match of, of everyone watching wow. everyone else trying to make the right move at the right time. And again, th that didn't surprise me that Centro won that race because his dad was all about like I was saying, the intuitive feeling mm -hmm. of knowing when to when to push, when to when to you know when to fold them, when to when to when to go, and uh, and that's the way Central won the race. He he actually led from the front, virtually the whole race, which is very unusual, and just kind of it was like a snake charmer. He 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 got them to all <laughs> the rest of the field followed him, and every time someone was like, "Oh, this pace is too slow. I think I'm going to make a move." Central would just, he, he would anticipate it right as they were thinking they were going to move. Wow. He would put it in a little move and prevent them from getting ahead. So he uh, ran on the inside lane the whole race, uh, wire to wire, didn't let anyone get past him, uh, even though he was far from the fastest runner in the field. So it was a, another great example wow. of if you can learn to run intuitively, feel the energy of the the, the, the the pack around you, all these things that I'm not particularly good at, but that Centro Senior was trying to teach me. Well, his son, uh, you know, really exhibited that. And uh, and won the Olympics as a result, which was pretty pretty amazing. Wow. Uh, it never fails to amaze me how many subtleties there are in professional sports and in all sorts of professional games and and athletics. And you know, someone like myself might watch and just go, "Wow, like can't they just take him on this corner?" You know, like there's so much going on, and it's a big mental game. Um, obviously not just in the training, but also during the race, which is, yeah, it's just super interesting to hear uh, that, uh, that you can win that on the slowest winning time, um, purely just because of this crazy chess match that's going on in, in a fairly short amount of time. It's, it's really quite interesting, but, um, I, I'd love to just, uh, before we move, um, further on, um, move from the sort of the really fast to the really small uh, and the really weird, um, I'd love to just brush over your physics. You've, you've discussed physics a few times and um, I'd love to hear a little bit about, um, you know, uh, how you got into specifically sort of quantum computing and uh, uh, nanomechanics and, and wh what those are just really briefly because I think they are yeah, just super interesting subjects. And I think Gareth, those things are, you know, we, we're both really interested to know from someone who actually understands it a little bit what, what they are. 
<laughs> yeah. I, I'm going to like pull up my other monitor here and, and Google what they are to see if I can remember. <laughs> it, it feels like another lifetime ago. Um, yeah. So my, my, uh, my physics journey was pretty, pretty, uh, uh, I don't know, accidental is, is, is maybe a word that that's appropriate. It was, it, it it just sort of happened in a sense. I like coming out of high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, I asked advice from a lot of people. I applied, I applied to university and applied to one university in history and to another one in engineering and to another one in physics. Cause I just had no idea what I wanted to do. And, uh, one of the pieces of advice I got, uh, was that if you don't know what you want to do, just make sure you do something hard because it'll prove that you can, you know, you, it'll give you problem solving abilities and, and, and so on. So I said, okay, physics is, is hard. So I'll, <laughs> I'll do it. I, 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 my older brother was at, was in his last year of university and he had a high school friend who was in the honors physics program at, at McGill, which is where I ended up going. And she said in, in the first year of the program, there'd been like 66, like 60 guys and six women in the program. And, and in the fourth, fourth year of the program, there were four guys and four girls left. So I thought that's a pretty high attrition rate. So it sounds, it sounds hard. Uh, <laughs> sign me up. I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, and so I did that and it was hard and it was interesting. Um, uh, and after four years, I was like, well, that was interesting. Now what's next? And I had no idea. And I, again, I applied to, I applied to grad school and the various opportunities to do, and I applied in some cases to do something totally different to do like history and again and stuff. And, um, the the one the best opportunity I got was to do a PhD in physics uh, in in Britain uh, and I, my approach to that was like my my plan B was to go and be like a bartender in Britain so I thought <laughs> or, or, you know to, to travel the world and kind of see things a little bit and so I thought well okay I can go and and treat physics as my nine to five job and and have a chance to live in a different part of the world and and meet different people and just experience things. And that worked out pretty well because in, in North America, um, if you do a, like a grad grad school, like a, a PhD in, in, in science or like in a physics, it, it, something like physics, you're expected to work 16 hours a day or something ludicrous. It's, it's basically like it becomes your life. In Britain, at least in, in the lab that I was in, they, they actually had kind of the opposite of approach. They, they really discouraged us from being there after hours, partly because the, the work I was doing, I was in a semiconductor physics group, and there was a lot of, there were safety issues for some, some of the uh, equipment. You know, you could have, things could go wrong if you were there by yourself in the middle of the night using um, pressurized gases and liquid nitrogen and stuff like that. <laughs> so they wanted us to work nine to five, and that was great for me. So I worked nine to five, and I, I ran, and I, I uh, traveled a lot. This was the dawn of this. I, I came there in 1997. It was just when air, air, airlines like Ryanair were getting going. Uh, and there were, they were really, there was actually, and there was EasyJet and uh, a few others where they were really battling each other, offering basically pay only the tax to fly somewhere. And if you were willing to fly at crappy times to crappy airports, you could go anywhere. So once a month or so, I'd head over to somewhere in Europe for, for 40 pounds and uh, spend one night, you know, in, Vienna or something. Uh, uh, anyway, it was fun. It was fun, but it wasn't like um, I did. I, I didn't end up finding a passion in physics. And so after my PhD, I moved back home. And this was the point at which I had to decide whether to go sort of keep on with running. So I, I was lucky enough to be able to move back home with my parents, uh, spend a year focusing on their, on running, seeing where I could get to. And after a year, it's like I'm back to my previous level, but I haven't made the breakthrough that I that I kind of needed to. And also, yeah, you know, I'm 24, 25, whatever I was, uh, you know, living with your parents gets a little a little old. Uh, I kind of and, you know, having no income and all sorts of things. So I, I went back into the physics world at that point. And this is where the physics got interesting for me is that I ended up doing a taking a postdoc position with it was a, a lab jointly run by the National Security Agency and uh, the University of Maryland. So because I'm Canadian, I couldn't work directly for the NSA, hmm. uh, but my paychecks came from the University of Maryland. But this lab, like half half the building, I wasn't even allowed to go into the building because it was you know half the building was classified because it was an NSA building. Um, but it wasn't my research wasn't classified. In fact, what, what they what they were trying to do. So there's an idea called quantum computing. Um, where the, the, the basic gist, and this is a, a, this is an oversimplification, but basically most computers operate by 
you know, uh, you have data stored in the form of zeros and ones, and you put operations on these zeros and ones to to do calculations. The idea of a quantum computer is that you, instead of a bit being zero or one, you have a quantum bit that can be zero, one, or a superposition of zero and one simultaneously. And when you have a bunch of information stored in quantum bits, you're able to uh, to do some calculations that are impossible on a normal classical computer. You can, and and one of the things you can, it turns out, it's the the way people often explain it, which isn't quite right, is that in, you, you can you can you can do a bunch of uh, calculations simultaneously because you're it, it, because the numbers aren't just zero and one; they're zero and one, and every possible combination of <laughs> zero and one. So you, it's, it's it's a little more subtle than that. But basically, one of the things you can do is uh, basically crack uh, the the encryption that's used in all internet transactions and a lot of security. So that's why the NSA was interested in it. No one has built a, a, a you know a fully functioning full-scale quantum computer that can do this even now. But if someone builds one, they'll more or less immediately be able to read all uh, classified, uh, not all, but uh, a large fraction of, of, of classified information these days. And so for, from the NSA's perspective, they need to know that the messages they send in 2018 aren't going to be decrypted in 2020 or 2030 even. They need to look ahead wow. and say, what's, what's possible in the future? So, right from the so the, the it was in the mid '90s that this what's called Shor's algorithm, this idea that a, cla a quantum computer would be able to uh, crack uh, modern encryption. Ever since that insight, the NSA was one of many organizations that was pouring money into this, partially because they wanted to build a quantum computer, but also because they wanted to know if anyone else was going to build a quantum computer. And so, so this is a bit of a long-winded explanation. No, it's it, very it's fascinating, but no, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. So, so I was, so the NSA was spending at the time I was there. I think they were spending about sixty million dollars a year uh, funding quantum computing research around the world because they wanted to have the, their finger in kind of every every pie just to know what was what was coming to see if anyone else was going to build one. But they also had their own uh, relatively small in-house quantum computing group, their own uh, research going on, and so that's where what I was working with. And because it was such such early going at the time, what I was doing was not trying to build a quantum computer. Essentially, the, 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 the group I was working with was trying to understand quantum mechanics because one of the key problems with trying to build a quantum computer is you can set up this, it's, uh, this quantum system, but it doesn't behave, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, continue to behave uh, in a quantum mechanical way. So... In quantum mechanics, you can have an electron, and you can say that electron can be in two places at once, and it can teleport, and it can do all these other wacky things. We know that a baseball doesn't do that, but we don't really know where is the boundary between an electron and a baseball, and why is it that the baseball can't teleport and be in two places at once? It, it, uh, the, the quantum signals uh, decohere, uh, or the, the quantum properties um, suffer from something called decoherence, and they and that, that that's they, they behave. They, so they start following classical Newtonian laws, but no one understands what's the biggest thing you can build that will obey uh, quantum mechanics. Because if you want to build a quantum computer, you need to build something that's pretty big that will that will follow quantum mechanical rules. So fundamentally, what my research was doing was trying to build, um, tr trying to trying to understand where that boundary was by trying to build bigger and bigger things that would behave quantum mechanically. So in my case, uh, nanoelectromechanics essentially meant that I was building mechanical systems, so little little bridges or cantilevers that were, you know, 50 nanometers wide, um, and trying to, you know, then using electricity to make those mechanical structures move. So you run a current through this little bridge and you can make it vibrate back and forth or you, run, you use a magnetic field or, or whatever the case may be. And then you want to see if you can make that bridge be essentially in two places at once, um, even though it's just 20 nanometers wide. And that's that's an on, you know, I left after in the very early stages of this sort of, of, of research, but it was it was a lot of fun. And it was the group I was with was, was great, like really interesting people. We had good funding, uh, not necessarily government funding is kind of irrational, like you, you never know what you're going to get. And then all of a sudden you have tons of money. And you have to spend it within a month, otherwise they take it away again or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but we had good funding, good people, a really, to me, an interesting problem. Like, to me, that was the key thing. It was like, 
when my PhD, I, I still have trouble explaining what the heck I was actually trying to do. <laughs> With my postdoc, it's like there's this big goal, like understanding where's the boundary between the quantum and the classical world. So all the, all these boxes were checked. I was like, this is amazing. And yet I'm still not as passionate about it as, as some of the other people in the lab. Like I would, I, you know, we, we would spend long hours in the lab, you know, 12, 16 hours in the lab. And then I would come in the next morning and someone would be like, hey, Alex, did you see that article in physics today about <laughs> such and such a thing? And I'm like, no, no, I was in the lab 16 hours yesterday. <laughs> when I went home, I did not think about physics for one second <laughs> until I came back in. But the other guys, they loved it so much uh, that they were going home and reading physics today. And that was kind of, part of the wake up call for me that's like okay now uh i've i'm i'm uh, i'm doing a really interesting project it's in a, in a really good environment but i still don't quite have the passion so i need to to think carefully about what it what it is that would uh be as engaging for me as physics is for these other guys and that that was mm -hmm. kind of the, the the road out of physics for me wow i mean I, i'm just like sitting here like mesmerized by what you had to say like it's you know for me i'm just so interested in even though i probably understood maybe like you know 50 percent of it it's just like <laughs> still fascinates me so much and i just think like you know what we're going through now in the world is just super super exciting um so obviously that was like you know it, it, it's sort of turning point i guess in your life you realized okay geez this is maybe not really what i want to do and you you made a um you made a sort of big decision to kind of just get out of it and sort of reinvent yourself, you know. And I think, did you say you you, re, you re went to school basically after that to study to be a, a journalist? And then, yeah, then things sort of really kicked off, you know, for you. Yeah. So when I was 28, I, I left my postdoc uh, um, and started a master's degree in journalism, which was one year. Um, and journalism, it's like, there's a lot you can learn about journalism, but really a couple of months of training is all you need to sort of understand the basics. And then it's just, uh, you know, getting experience. So I did a year of journalism school and that was adequate. Uh, and then I got an, a summer internship with a, uh, a local newspaper in Canada called the Ottawa Citizen. And after, after four months of summer internship, they also had a one year internship, internship training program. So I went straight into that. So I spent 16 months as a general assignment reporter, um, writing, I, I wrote, I don't know, about 300 stories for them during that period. And it was, you know, a lot of breaking news, a lot of, you know, car accidents. Uh, one that I always remember, and I covered a dog fashion show, um, <laughs> you know, like raising money for charity. Uh, so um, not necessarily the stories that I would choose to, to cover, but it was, it was, and, and in a lot of cases, stuff that I really didn't like covering, you know, the car accident stuff. It's like, I, I don't like knocking on a door and saying, Hey, how, you know, how do you feel about your, your son just, you know, yeah. getting hit by a car? Um, but it was, it was good training. I, I wrote a lot. I got, I got a lot better at, uh, writing quickly, uh, at, at understanding what, what sorts of writing, uh, held people's attention and what didn't at, at talking to people, which is not like I'm a, the one, the one thing I was probably most worried about uh, in terms of being a journalist is I'm a, you know, I'm very introverted. I have trouble speaking to, uh, strangers, especially if I'm asking prying questions and things like that and feel like I'm bothering people. Um, I'm still, that's still probably my, you know, my, one of my biggest weaknesses as a journalist, but, but certainly being, spending 16 months as a general assignment reporter with the newspaper, you, you get over that a little bit. You, you, you learn to, to go up and, and talk to people. Um, so that was, that was 2004. 2006 at the citizen really good um really you know challenging but but good training ground and i went freelance after that um mainly because there were no jobs like <laughs> i went it, it, saying i went freelance sounds like i was like wow i'm choosing to do this it's like uh well <laughs> i had to pay the rent so i was like i'm, I'm gonna start uh uh um you know writing for whoever will pay me and, and, and initially i was i had a friend who knew the editor of the the bottom line, which is Canada's accounting. Um, you may not be familiar with it, but it's Can uh, the, uh, Canada's uh, monthly accounting newsletter for accountants. <laughs> um, so so I, I learned uh, learned a little bit about accounting. Wrote about that. Wrote for the Lawyers Weekly and a few other places like that. And and then started to kind of gravitate towards the stuff that, like I was saying, that I found particularly interesting and where I had some interesting background myself. Like the I had science background. I had sports background. So I started writing about the science of sports and, uh, and, uh, yeah, that was more, you know, 10 or 11 years ago now. And it, it's, it's, uh, 
I didn't in- set out intending to be a specialist and I still kind of feel like I'd like to branch out and be a bit more of a generalist because I think that's one of the attractions of journalism for me is that you can write about different things and, and explore different areas and follow, follow, you know, you, you don't have to start I don't have to start a new career to, to find out more about, you know, uh, jazz. I can go write some articles about jazz. So, so that's, mm. but, but because of, because of my interest and expertise, I ended up zeroing in more and more on the science of endurance. And that's, that's kind of become my, my area of specialty. Yeah, that's that's so cool. Like um, so like yeah, like you said, I, I, go ahead, Craig. No, no, go ahead. Oh no, I was gonna say like um, you know, you said you've got a like a broad range of kind of like, or first of all, who you've written for. You've written for a lot of like great publications, but then you've also written three uh, three books, and I guess they they also are quite different um, in terms of the the subjects that they cover. And your last one is particularly interesting about uh, endurance and mindset and I guess the you know the difference and, and this, the relationship between you know the physical body and the, the mental side of things um, and I just just to kind of like get into that I just like to ask a question based on on this weekend so this weekend uh, as I'm sure you know was the London Marathon and uh, a guy called Mo Farah, uh, which obviously you know as well, um, he basically he came third in it. Uh, and but the interesting thing was is that he now has the British record for the eight hundred, the fifteen, the three thousand, the five thousand, the ten thousand, the half marathon, and the marathon. Like that is first of all remarkable, and. Like, what are your thoughts on it? Like, in terms of the mindset that the, he has, you know, to to be such a to be so good at all of those different distances, because you know the difference between eight hundred and and a marathon is vast, and the the racing styles and the physical um, just what you need, you know, to actually perform at those is just completely different. So, if we can just maybe like ease into it and go go from from that as a sort of starting point. Yeah, so Farah is definitely a, Mo Farah is an interesting case. I, I, just one quick correction: I'll say his 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 shortest record is the fifteen hundred. The the eight hundred is still uh, Sebastian Coe, I think. Oh, is it? Um, okay, cool, cool. But st- none the, the 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 point is exactly the same because the fifty his fifteen hundred record is like three twenty eight, I think, or three twenty nine. So just so three and a half minutes, and the marathon record is you know t- two hours and six minutes. Those are very very different events mm-hmm. physiologically, psychologically. So it's it's you know almost unprecedented for someone to have that kind of range. There are a few you know comparable examples. There's a guy named Rod Dixon who was an Olympic medalist at the 1500 and in the 70s and won the New York Marathon in the early 80s. So he was he was a new, uh, guy from New Zealand who was you know definitely world class you know Olympic medal and, and New York Marathon champ at, at across that range too. So what makes Farah so unique? Um, his physiology is definitely, um, uh, you know, uh, more or less unprecedented. It's 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 hard to sort of say anything about it because it's so unusual it's that that someone could be that good at at short races and long races. To me, what's really remarkable about Farah is actually you know, so his times are amazing, but his competitive record is even more amazing. The fact that he's managed to win gold medals at, at the Olympics and world championships, uh, particularly in the 5,000 and 10,000 meters time after time, after time, uh, going back to 2011. And even for some of the greatest runners in history, uh, people like Kenanisa Bikili and, uh, Haley Gabriel Salazi, if, if, you know, if you're the greatest runner, that maybe means you're a, you know, a, a percent or a fraction of a percent better than anyone else in the world at that time. And what that means is that you go to the Olympics and the World Championships is usually you win, but not always. Yeah. And f- f- so Farah had this sort of unbroken record of consecutive uh, titles. And so to me that so it, it probably suggests that he's capable of running even faster than he did for over over some of the distances. But it also suggests that the, that to, to me, uh, of course, the, like so his 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 physiological capabilities, his you know, his muscular efficiency and his, uh, you know, maximum oxygen uptake and things like that are obviously spe- spectacular, but he, he is clearly, 
uh, on another level mentally to be able to rise to the occasion over and over again. Now, and he didn't win the London Marathon, of course. I think he was yeah. third. Yeah. Um, um, so it's not like he's invincible or anything like that. But I think probably what allowed him to run so – one of the things that allowed him to run so well in a marathon for a guy who's also run very well in – short distances is the same mindset that made him a winner at the champion at, at championships over and over again. And, you know, like, you know, there, there's, he, he's, he's also a mystery because he became, well, he, he became a world beater in his mid to late twenties. He was, he was good, but not great until, you know, 26 or 28. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of sort of questions about what, what changed to allow him to, to, to make that leap. But, 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 uh, He's, it, there aren't many parallels in history for someone who's had that kind of range. Yeah, absolutely. C can you say something about his, his training? Because I'd imagine, like, how do you even begin to train for all of those? Or is it, do you just focus on one for a while? Or? Yeah, so it's very unlikely that he could run, or I, I, would, I would pretty much guarantee that right now, having just, you know, it, being in his marathon training, his 1500 time would no longer be as good as it was three or four years ago. Uh, and conversely, he did run a marathon a couple of years ago, and it was a couple minutes slower uh, than, than this one because he was still working on the tra on, on his track mm -hmm. speed. You can't, you can't have everything at once. So that's, that's one important thing to, to note that uh, it, it, there is, there is, uh, there are choices to be made. Another thing that's kind of uh, that I think a lot of people don't realize is the extent to which even a, a, a three or four minute effort is an aerobic endurance effort that has a lot in common with the marathon. So if you look, one of the things you can do is say, okay, if I do an, uh, if I go do a race, how much of my energy comes from aerobic energy, which is the sort of long sustainable energy that requires oxygen uh, to use and how much of it comes from anaerobic energy, which is the sort of short term reserves that you can only rely on for, for a few minutes. Um, the break point, the sort of 50, 50 point is somewhere around two minutes. So if you do a two minute effort, you're, you're, you're kind of half aerobic, half anaerobic. And so if you go to a four minute effort, you're something like two thirds aerobic. And by the time you get to the 5,000 meters, which is the lower end of Farah, Farah's, uh, sort of, uh, sweet spot, it's all, it's like 97% aerobic. So to go from 5,000 meters, which is maybe a 13 minute race for him to, to, to a two hour race, you're going from a 97% aerobic, uh, effort to a, you know, 99.9% .9 aerobic effort. So it, it, there's actually more similarities than, mm -hmm. than you might, than you might expect. There are definitely differences. Like one of the big limitations in marathons is a guy like Farah. Normally, if you take a guy like Farah, who's a great track runner, Running marathon pace is relatively easy for him, and it's not that he runs into, like, uh, that he's out of breath. It's that his legs, a lot, a lot of track runners, have, have a particular powerful, bouncy stride instead of an, because they need to be able to accelerate instead of a, a, a sort of efficient, uh, uh, very non-bouncy stride. And so when they run a marathon, their legs get trashed by the time they've been running for 90 minutes. And so mm. that's what one of the things that holds them back. Um, and I speak, you know, I was a 1500 meter runner. I ran one marathon. That's, that's exactly how I felt. It's like the last half of the, or the last quarter of the marathon was very easy for me from a, you know, a breathing perspective. It was very mm. hard for me because, because my legs were pounded. So, so Farah, and he may have made some specific adjustments to his stride, or it may just be that he, he has a smooth enough stride and has done enough mileage over the years that he's, he's sort of hardened his body to be able to last Jeez. last a long time but th so there's those are two of the things the other thing you know like honestly i i i, I sort of hate to do the, hate to say it but uh um people have also asked a lot of questions about because farah made his big in terms of what changed in his training he was a very good international runner and then he uh moved to oregon to train with uh with alberto salazar at, at nike headquarters uh, in his in his i, I can't remember if he was 26 or 28 but he, he and then immediately became a world champion and there've been a, a lot of discussions about what he, what he has, what he changed. Uh, he, he started running his, his, his easy days. He started running a little bit harder. According to, to Salazar, he started to do some serious weights like squats, uh, um, uh, you know, lunges, those sorts of like deadlifts, um, which is, which is a bit, a bit of a trend in, in running these days. It used to be the, the, th the, th the thinking used to be that you should only do if you if you're if you're an endurance athlete you should do you know 
light weights, high reps, don't put on any, any bulk. The truth is most endurance athletes aren't going to put on a lot of muscle. No, yeah. no matter. Yeah. They, they, they should, they should be so lucky as to have the problem of putting on too much muscle. <laughs> yeah. And so doing the heavier weights, uh, is, is now thought to be actually pretty useful for getting the neuromuscular, uh, as getting, 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 it improves your neuromuscular signaling. So it makes you a more efficient runner, even if it doesn't actually put on, um, if, if you're not putting on muscle, you get stronger without getting bigger. And so that was a big change in, in his training. But the, the other thing is that Salazar's group has been under investigation over the last few years for mm. kind of gray area stuff, whether they were doing things that were, uh, not illegal, but not quite legal either. Uh, and you know, I, I hate to, to throw shade where, where there's been no, uh, um, proof. Not, 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 yeah, there's been no proof or no, you know, demonstration of anything wrong. But I think, you know, it's part of the discussion in professional sports these days when someone becomes a world beater halfway through their career. Um, whether, you know, even, even if it was all, even if there was nothing against the rules, which I, I, you know, personally, my guess is that there was nothing against the rules. Um, but if you're, if you're trying to figure out, well, what is it that Farah did that I can emulate? Well, maybe there's things he was doing that we don't even know, like, cause they're very secretive too. So we don't, we don't know all the ingredients mm. that, that went, that might've went into giving him that, that, that little edge. But I also think, I do think going to Salazar's group, um, just to go back to the theme of the, the mental aspect of performance, going to Salazar's group and feeling like I'm training in a group where all resources are available. Nothing will be spared that would that would make me go faster. We're trying everything, even some stuff that that doesn't really have, you know, like cryosaunas and things like that, where there's not really any evidence that it's useful. But you feel like, well, this cryosauna costs a hundred thousand dollars, and I'm using it after <laughs> each runs. Must be doing something, or else it wouldn't cost so much. I, I think he probably gained <laughs> a lot of confidence from the feeling that he had the best preparation in the world, bar none, and that maybe also helped him. Uh, you know, generate the self-confidence that's necessary to become such a, you know, uh, a championship caliber runner. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so, it's so yeah. interesting. Like, I mean, it's, it's just crazy. So like, this, uh, like from what I know of your book, for, like it was eight years of research um, that, that you did to, before you sort of published it. And the outcome was not necessarily like, what you would have wanted it wasn't like a specific yeah this is exactly what is more prevalent you know so do you just wanted like maybe explain to us a little bit like what your final sort of synopsis on it on it was like and and maybe just also a little bit more about the book too yeah so this was one of the great agonies if you're pitching a book if you want to write a book everyone emphasizes to you, you have to get your elevator pitch down. You have to be able to say in three sentences what the book is, what readers are going to get from it, you know, what's what's exciting and new about it. And and honestly, one of the big barriers, one of the things that took me so long to write the book is trying to figure out what is it that I'm trying to say? Because it's very hard to encapsulate. I don't have a simple message that it's like, you know, you know, eat more bananas and you're going to, you know, you're going to double your endurance. <laughs> like it, it, it's, um, I, I, initially when I started the book, I thought I was, I, I thought it was going to be, I had encountered this uh, bunch of research by, by Tim Noakes, uh, a South African researcher, uh, emphasizing that the brain, um, that, that, you know, when you reach, when you reach the point where you can't con feel like you can't continue often, it's the brain, not your muscles that, that has reached that point of, of, it's of holding you back rather than you're actually on the verge of collapse. And so I thought, I thought I could write a pretty simple or not simple, but a straightforward book with the subtext that, or with the message that, you know, limits are, uh, you know, limits are all in your head and, and, and it's all, you know, it's, it's your brain that holds you back in endurance. The problem is that as you know, the more research I did, the, the, the more complex and nuanced and unclear the picture became. And it's, it's, it's sort of, it's not all in your head, right? Like you can't just decide to, 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 to run a world record. Um, uh, no matter how tough you are, um, at the same time, it's not all in your muscles. Like as 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 experiences like mine and uh, many many other people have have subjectively experienced the fact that you know there, there's more to performance than just uh, you know what your VO2 max is. So, um, so I really struggled trying to trying to trying to articulate what am I going to tell people about 
endurance and how am I, what's, what is it going to say on the back of the book? Um, you know, what is it about? So here's my attempt, I guess, having, having done it now and having, having written the book, I think what the book is, is, um, it's an attempt to understand what defines our limits in, in, in different contexts where you, when you, when you reach the point where you can't go any faster or you can't go any farther or you can't maintain your pace for any longer, what is it that holds you back? And I look at that in a variety of contexts. So it's not just, you know, if you're running a marathon, it's like if you're free diving, if you're climbing a mountain, if you're on a hot day, if you haven't drunk. So I have chapters on heat and thirst and pain. Is it pain that holds you back? Is it your muscles? Is it your muscle fibers that reach their limit? I try and explore each of these potential limiting factors uh, and uh, explore at what point they're real limits versus at what at what point they're they feel like real limits, but they're actually just warning signs rather than stop signs. A great example would be uh, breath holding, um, which is I, I explored in the context of uh, of uh, whether oxygen is a is a limiting factor. And it's like I know what it feels like to hold my breath until I can't hold my breath anymore, but the world record for breath holding is 11 minutes and 35 seconds. Wow. And, you know, it, it's, it's a different, uh, and, and what they, but the, the thing is that what feels like a limit in breath holding is it's your carbon dioxide levels. You, they, they rise and they force your, your breathing muscles to start convulsing. Um, and that's what, for, if you try hard enough, that's what will limit you and me. Uh, Free divers have learned to kind of suppress that. They, they still get the, the the contractions of their breathing muscles triggered by carbon dioxide levels, but they can keep their mouth closed and not breathe. And so they can hold their breath until they actually are literally running out of oxygen and about to pass out. Uh, and 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 the the limit there is like halfway. You know, they might they might start reaching their carbon dioxide limits after four or five minutes, but they can they can just uh, decide to ignore that and and mm. get, they get another factor of two. So all of which is to say. Um, I, ex I've explored, see, see, as I, as I promised, this is not a three sentence explanation of what's in my book, but, uh, um, it, so exploring limits in that sense of trying to understand where, where the limits are, are warning signs and where they're real. And the, the overall theme of the book that emerged is that the vast, in the vast majority of cases, what feels like a limit is more of a warning sign. Uh, it's your brain imposing uh, a, a limit before your your physical body is the physical part of your body is actually failing, and that, and again to you know to, to super emphasize this this doesn't mean that you can just choose to um, you know ignore those limits or or change them by just by deciding, but it does mean that the, they're a little bit more negotiable than you might otherwise think, and that as a result things like your mindset um, can actually have a measurable effect on where where you encounter what feel like your physical limits you can you can you can manipulate your physical limits a little bit by manipulating your brain so that's that i think is what the book ends up being about well let me just say that if, if you wanted to say the name of your book i think your name is succinct and it's a really really great name of the book ah oh, thank you yeah the, the book is called endure and the subtitle which is where the the, the real action is is mind body and the curiously elastic limits of human performance so that's that that's the the curiously elastic bit is the the, mm. the the point that i think is is what i that, that i try and emphasize and that i hope uh, people find interesting yeah it, it certainly piques one's interest uh, in that and i think that's why it's such a such a really really good name and look i think as we move forward in in, in in science and many other fields is there's there is a bit of that gray area with with the mind you know and uh, it is a hard thing to to have definitive data on specifically on on where the one system ends and the other one begins and i think it's great research and and great questions that you're you're asking because obviously people you know this, this is an, something that as we move forward, will become more and more important uh, to us as human beings, I reckon. But um, earlier on, you mentioned Tim Noakes, and uh, obviously, us being South Africans, we'd we'd love to just you know dwell there for a moment. Um, I remember back in the day, you know, with Comrades Marathon, and 
all of that in South Africa. Back in the day, Tim Noakes used to say things like, you know, get on those uh, massive bowl of, uh, you know, pasta and all of that. And obviously that that turned around a lot. He's, you know, the, his message changed sort of 180 um, to, to sort of the lower end of the carbohydrate spectrum. Can you just say something a, a little bit about um, – that sort of endurance and then pumping your muscles to get your glycogen levels up and what have you. And then now they start doing endurance sports with a, a low carbohydrate, sort of a high fat uh, diet. What are the differences and, and what is your experience on being better? Yeah, boy, this is a this is a hot button issue, as as, uh, yeah. as Tim Noakes has, has demonstrated. Well, just to, before I get into that, let me say this: that that you know, on one in one level, it's it's it feels funny to have Noakes who is who again had this you know this great book the lore of running with all these chapters on nutrition and now he's saying tear those chapters out you know don't yeah. even look at them I, <laughs> yeah. I regret them and you sort of say well <laughs> how could you tell us something so wrong and I think that the, the point he makes in response to that is a good one and he says look uh, and uh, you know if the evidence changes I, I change my mind like so mm. um I think he's he's uh, not just in this area but in other areas too he's sometimes criticized for having uh you know his ideas change or evolve um, and I think that's, that shouldn't be a, a downside. That should be a positive. Um, yeah. on the, I, you know, I would say if, if you've <laughs> been through the experience of having your, um, your opinions changed by 180 degrees, uh, it's probably good to, to be humble about your current state of knowledge. You know, it should be a reminder that what you think, you know, now might change dramatically in, you know, in a short period of time. So, um, so cer certainly, uh, when when I discuss this stuff, I would I would say it's important to, uh, um, from my perspective, I don't know the answers, and I'm not going to pretend I know the answers. Um, I can give you my my perspective right now, but but uh, as we've seen, it, it's possible for things to change a lot. Mm -hmm. In terms of the the high carb versus the 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 LCHF low carb high fat approach to endurance. Um, one thing, I, one thing I think is fair to say is very, you know, it's clear is that there, it, there's been a surprising change in our level, uh, state of knowledge about the, 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 the ability to do prolonged endurance exercise with vir virtually no carbohydrates. Um, it, it, people may sort of forget, conveniently forget this now, but 10 years ago, the vast majority of sports nutritionists would have said it's more or less impossible. You can't run a marathon if you don't have, if you haven't taken carbs, you're going to explode your head. You know, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> um, and now thanks in part, we're probably led by the experience of a bunch of people who did it and now being bolstered by, by some, re you know, some research, it's clear that it is possible to, to, live on a LCHF diet and to do endurance events, to do marathons and do ultra marathons and things like that. And so that, that's a change, you know, and, and science moves pretty slowly. So we don't, it's not often, if I say like, if I look back to what I, what I thought I knew 10 years ago when I started writing in this area and what I th think I know now, um, there's not all that much that has changed because things move slowly. Mm -hmm. That's, that's something that has changed. The, 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 the harder question is not, is it possible, but is it better? Mm. Um, and certainly there's lots of people who, who are insist that it is better. Um, and I, I'm, I'm less convinced by that. Now there's, there's, there's different things, right? Like is, is LCHF better for your health? I have no idea. And I, like, I'm not, um, uh, I don't know. Is it better for performance? Uh, I, I have a little better idea there. At least I have a stronger opinions there that I don't think there's any evidence that it's that it's better um, in uh, uh, in the context of say in a mar in a marathon. And and you know, if we want to talk anecdotal evidence, you could say, well, let's ask the fastest you know ten thousand mm -hmm. marathoners in history, and w I think we'll find that probably ten thousand of them were relying on uh, very high carbohydrate diets. If you look at the the fastest hundred marathoners in the world or in history, they're almost all East African and the, they, they tend to, there's been analyses of their diets. They tend to eat between 60 and 80% carbohydrate. And they get, you know, Kenyan marathoners typically get 
like 20% of their calories from the sugar they put in their tea and their porridge. Wow. So, wow. you know, and this is not like, I'm not saying, Hey, that's what I'm going to start doing. That <laughs> um, but, but you know, but these guys aren't fat. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think, um, and I, I, I think the claim that, that, that LCHF is better because it allows you stores to your access to your fat store stores is, is maybe not, uh, it, it doesn't. It doesn't result in better marathon times for most. In in, in most cases, in, in uh, the people. If you look at the Olympics, nobody's doing that, and and uh, that doesn't prove that they wouldn't all be better if they did. But p- athletes are pretty good at self experimentation, mm. and there is, you know, there are some reasons. There's there's some data showing that you get a little bit less efficient. You get a little bit less uh, energy per unit of oxygen. When you're relying just on fat rather than carbohydrate, carbohydrates a, a, a slightly more efficient form of energy during intense exercise. Those these are subtle things, um, and for most of us, they're irrelevant. I think like if if you're if you're choosing between an LCHF diet and a and a more conventional diet, um, you wouldn't. Uh, and if if you're not trying to win the Olympics, you wouldn't make the choice based on whether you, you know it's five percent more efficient or two percent more efficient. Mm. Uh, you'd make a choice based on other reasons, presumably based more on on health reasons. Yeah. Um, are there are there situations where LCHF is better than, uh, you know, for athletic performance and endurance in particular? Um, there could be. The, the I think particularly of things like ultra marathons, where it's really popular, uh, or even like um, mountaineering expeditions. If you're in a context where you're out there for not not for four hours, but for four days. Or, or even for 12 hours or eight hours, um, fueling becomes a real challenge because it's hard to take in uh, a, a lot of food when you're exercising hard. And so people get stomach problems, uh, mm. gastrointestinal problems. And so the limitation isn't so much their metabolic efficiency, it's their it's their ability to take in enough fuel for their efforts without throwing up or, or getting diarrhea. And so if you can be more reliant on fat on the fat that your body already stores and you have to carry all your food with you so you don't have convenient access to to food stops then it, it I, hypothetically at least i can see mm. the potential advantage to lchf and i think that's where the, the that that approach has gotten a lot of traction is in in the ultra running community in particular so um i guess the, the last thing i should say on this is is just uh you know put my money where my mouth is uh how do i eat I, I kind of eat like Michael Pollan, uh, sort of mm. eat food, yeah. mostly plants, yeah. not too much. Um, so I don't, I don't eat a ton of meat. I don't, I, I, try, I certainly try not to eat a ton of like sugar and processed carbs, mm. but I, you know, I love my pasta still. And, and, uh, I try and eat a balanced diet that's mostly food. Um, and so I don't, and, and for whatever reason, whether it's because I run a lot or whether it's because I have lucky genetics or whether because I'm kidding myself, I'm, I don't struggle with my weight. Um, uh, it doesn't mean that doesn't necessarily mean I'm super healthy. I need to be able, I obviously need to watch things like blood sugar levels, but I don't, I don't have a compelling reason to try and reshape my, my diet. Cause I feel like I'm generally pretty healthy. Um, but if I was, if I was doing all the things I'm doing now, but I was 50 pounds overweight, then I would be more, more yeah, interested sure. in try, trying other approaches. So I do think, um, what, one, th- one thing I'm really cautious of is like, I, I, I'm comfortable with what's working for me. And so it's easy for me to say like, why would anyone do anything different? Like mm. it, it, this, this works perfectly for me. Well, people are different. And so I, I, I don't know what works for anyone else. So I'm, I do think it's, it's kind of like there's this whole barefoot running thing that, that came out of nowhere, like eight, nine years ago and became this huge, huge fad and has faded back away a little bit. Uh, it's no longer, there's no longer quite as many barefoot evangelists, but the result is the shoe landscape has changed. I run in lighter shoes than I used to, and there's more options, more different possibilities. It's not just all shoes are built the same because there's a realization Mm -hmm. that for some people it works really well to get these very minimal shoes. And I think from a diet perspective, it's also great that, um, there's an, there's there are some other diets that have gained mainstream respectability and that may work really really well for some people and so it's great to have that as an option and I don't think in the same way that I wouldn't say my di- diet must necessarily be the right diet for everybody I, I don't think LCHF is either but I think mm. there are there are uh, it's it's a legitimate approach for people to 
or maybe a legitimate approach for, for, for people to try. And, and some people will have certainly had great success with it. It's a good analogy with the, uh, with the barefoot running. Yeah. 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 And they're definitely, they're, they're linked, right? Like they 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 have some sort of spiritual, uh, similarities in this idea of going back to a, to a sort of, uh, simpler or ancestral, uh, seemingly ancestral approach to, to eating or to, yeah. to living rather, you know, to running or to eating. Yeah, yeah, sure. absolutely. It's, it's so interesting. And then just as we kind of, uh, I guess, drawing to like a finish here now, there, there's one thing that I would, you know, just like to touch on. And, and you know, you mentioned shoes getting lighter um, as a result of sort of barefoot running. And you were recently involved in or reporting an event uh, for Runner's World around the marathon time uh, world record that Nike uh, set up a team to beat. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about that? Like actually, you know, sort of the lead up to it, what they did and actually being at the event because it was like quite an emotional thing, especially if you are like a runner and you've been involved in it your whole life. Yeah, this was this was really interesting. So this was Nike two, Nike's breaking two uh, effort and uh, they wouldn't just divulge the numbers, but I guess they spent tens of millions of dollars. There's certainly millions and millions of dollars Try, you know, selecting some runners, three runners to try and run a sub two hour marathon under artificial conditions. So not, not, uh, they, they did it on a formula one track, uh, and they had pacers mm-hmm. that were uh, jumping in and out, which made it not el- eligible for a world record. But what was interesting to me was, um, the, the, the really strong visceral reaction from, from people, particularly in the running community, a, lo- a lot of people really hated this idea that uh, that this corporation would would be sponsoring this race that wasn't going to obey world record rules and was going to uh, you know not not be a real competition in the sense that it wasn't about winning and losing it was just about the time uh, so there was a lot of and, and that they were introducing not just things like uh, like having dra- six pacemakers uh, for for drafting purposes but also they had a new pair of shoes that had that have a, a carbon fiber plate in the in the insole uh, that that according to lab testing makes runners on average four percent more efficient in the shoes. So there's technology, there's corporate influences, mm. there's sort of spirit of competition, um, and you know I think these were all legitimate concerns. Uh, like they were all things that I had misgivings about too. But boy, the this, it's the vehemence of of some of the the uh, the critiques was really, really uh, beyond what I expected, and I, I got a lot of criticism just for being willing to cover it. Wow. Um, you know, I got wow. a lot of accusations that I was a you know Nike shill and so on. And I was like, oh, I'm just wow. trying to write about what's happening. Like this is news, and it's Jeez. kind of interesting. Like, yeah. you yeah. know, if if, you, if you're a, a running fan, aren't you kind of interested to know what Elliot Kipchoge, the Olympic champion, could run yes, totally. if they made sure that the weather was yeah. perfect and the pacing was perfect and the course. course was smooth? So, so I found it. You know, to me, it's like there was a real polarized approach in the uh, response in the running community. And to me, it's like, why can't those two things co- coexist? Of course, it's a marketing stunt. Yes, yeah. it's a marketing stunt. But it's also pretty cool. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. uh, so it was interesting to be. So it was at, in, at the Formula One track in Monza in, in northern Italy. And uh, they had a dress rehearsal there in March, which I went to cover. And then they had a uh, uh, the final race in May of last year. And um in, in, you know, the funny thing is that the way it was set up is they had three runners and then they had a sort of rotating cast of six pacemakers in front of them and a pace car in front of that. Uh, so the goal was to drive or to, to run at exactly two hour pace until they couldn't anymore. So it's like when you think about it, it's like that's not a very compelling spectator event, is it? Because it's like. <laughs> Nothing's going to happen. There's going to be no pace changes. Like it's the opposite of what I was saying earlier with Matt Centrowitz and and uh, uh, you know tactics and the chess match. There's mm. no chess here. They're not even playing checkers. It's just like, <laughs> all right, just run until you can't. So I thought it was good. I, I thought it had the danger of being really really boring. Um, yeah. But actually, it turned out to be just totally compelling. Um, mainly because Elliot Kip- there were three runners, but two of them basically only made it halfway. Wow. Uh, Elliot Kipchoge, who's the defending Olympic champion, so he was out there alone for the second half. But wow. once he went through halfway, uh, he was ev- you know basically every step was unknown territory. No one had ever run at that pace for that long, starting at, after the halfway mark, and and it was it was really uh, surprisingly 
sort of remarkable and inspirational. And it was, you know, it was like at the crack of dawn, it was really early. I was jet lagged. So I was probably also like half delirious, but it was just like, (laughs) it became this increasingly sort of, you know, semi-spiritual experience. And, and he ended up like, so he didn't break two hours. He ran two flat zero two two minutes zero and two hours zero minutes and 25 seconds so the, and the, wow. that's two and a half minutes faster than the world record um it's not a world record but it was still you know just an incredible performance and it was it ended up being just this absolutely transcendent performance and and it was it was quite interesting because there were so many people who were so critical of it uh who nonetheless got up and watched you know the streaming in the middle of the night and a lot of people were grudgingly converted to the idea that okay that that was pretty cool uh-huh. like it, it was it was you know it, it, at the end of the day it was a performance of uh, a really remarkable human one of the sort of great Jeez. athletes of his generation on what to this to this point at least i think would have to be the best day of his life so one of the greatest athletes in history on the best day producing one of the best performances of his life and you know that, that's just something that's special you don't you don't get to see that very often and so wow. i think that there was everyone there had the sense that they were witnessing something special someone getting pretty much as close to his uh his ultimate limits as anyone i've ever seen so uh wow. so yeah it, it, it was cool wow, it, was, it was surprisingly cool that's so cool it must have been enthralling hey? how, how amazing is that that people can you know just through the sheer um power and and pace and awesomeness of that uncharted territory they can actually just you know totally enthrall them as well even though they were anti it and and that's just a testament to these this kind of athlete you know how, how was he after the race he was he was tired <laughs> <laughs> um, but he he was delighted so he was you know there you, you wonder okay how, how do you interpret two flat 25 is it a failure because he didn't get under two or is it a success? And to him, it was an unparalleled success because he he had done what, you know, we, Runner's World, we, we, we did a, a poll before the, the the race. They had people calling around to running experts around the world, getting people to, okay, guess the time, guess the time, guess the time. Mm-hmm. And I think like only two people out of, uh, I, don't, I can't remember, 30 or whatever experts thought he would run anywhere near that fast. So yeah. it was, he totally confounded expectations. And so he he knew that he had done something special and he took that he took that away with him of uh, uh, the sort of this sense that he had done some um you know and he's the one who won the london marathon this yeah, past yeah. weekend but he's he's yeah. he's he 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 took something away about his own uh you know his his own mental strength and his own abilities and he's a real he's a really interesting guy and, and a sort of a really articulate and outspoken about the idea that that self belief is 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 really important that you you can't do anything that you don't believe you can do and so he uh, I think he he went into it believing he could do it, and he came out of it knowing that he had done something special. Yes. Yeah, That's brilliant. Exactly. And now I watched his interview yesterday, and he's just he's such a nice guy, isn't he? He's just so humble, like quietly spoken. But geez, what a performer! It's rather it's rather amazing. I just I just love I love a sportsman like that, you know. Um, and so Alex, so. Uh, for people to find out a bit more about you, uh, for them to get hold of your book, uh, can you just let us know uh, the best places, please? Yeah, for sure. Uh, probably the easiest place to find me is on Twitter. Uh, my handle is Sweat Science. Uh, and whenever I have new articles or, or see other articles that I find interesting, I, I post that there. Uh, so that's, that's a good place to start. Uh, I have a, my website is alexhutchinson.net. Uh, and that you can get a little more background, old articles and, and you know, I can't remember if I have anything posted about my like physics background or anything, but anyway, a little more detail there. <laughs> um, the book is available more or less worldwide, I think, uh, you know, on Amazon and at local bookstores and the local book chains. And again, it's called Endure Mind, Body, and the Curiously Elastic Limits of Human Performance. Cool. That's so yeah, cool. Bro, uh, yeah, love so, it. Yeah. So, so we put together like tons of show notes and, you know, all that information will be in there and we'll share it with all of our listeners. They'll be delighted to to hear this podcast and to you know to read your books that's for sure so i just wanted to say like massive thank you for coming on the podcast um you've been such a cool guy from the start like just like so nice so genuine just like so easy to deal with which is just validates for us like how cool first of all canadians are because like (laughs) exactly to this day like whenever i've traveled the world 
and run into Canadians, they're like, I'm like, you guys are just always so cool. So it's great. It's like, you know, um, maybe it's maybe it's got to do with the outdoor lifestyle because each of you seem to have this amazing outdoor lifestyle growing up. So it keeps you uh, nice and humble as, as people. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of the podcast, you know, you just shared so much amazing information with us. Um, I was like, I'm going to have to go listen to this a few times now just to, you know, take it all in again. And but also just thank you for sharing your story with us. You know, I think people love hearing the story and uh, there's just so much value in that. And um, it's just nice to hear about you and, and, and who you are and the interesting things that you've gone through. And, and, you know, we didn't get to touch a million different things, you know, and one day uh, in the future, we'd, we'd love to when Craig and I eventually are, you know, together in person and have our own studio and stuff, we, we'd like to sort of get you over for you know a longer period of time and, and have a good chat so thank you so much um it's been super enjoyable and really fascinating uh, from my end thank you man well thanks so much guys i really appreciate the the, the kind invitation and uh it's been a lot of fun to to reflect on uh, on uh you know all these experiences it's uh, i really appreciate it That's and cool. just briefly from from my side there alex it's uh, uh i like gareth uh, alluded to there uh, your fans uh have definitely going to get a, a another facet of your of who you are and and what makes you you and and how you got to where you are and i think everyone will totally agree of, of what a genuinely uh, nice person you are and and that in this day and age just seems to um, mean so much uh, to people and i think uh, you can't help but uh, uh, be in, you know totally zoned into what you're saying uh, and with a, a big smile on your face because it's it's just such an interesting story, but coming from such a nice person. So uh, that always means so much to us and also to uh, our listeners uh, and, and everyone out there, I reckon. So so thank you so much for, for being so generous with your time and uh, with your story. And uh, we just uh, yeah, can't wait to actually dig into uh, your book is, uh, you know, that it's just super interesting stuff. And it's on the, the limit of, of, uh, of what's really important these days with the mind and the body. And, and so we just can't wait to, to hear more from you and just to follow all your, your, your little journeys that you're busy with and, and with your family as well. And, uh, you know, that's, that's going to be a whole new journey for you as well down the track and seeing them grow. So, so thanks so much and, uh, and have yourself a, a wonderful week further. Okay, thanks, you too. Cool, thanks, bud. Thanks. Cool.